I think, I think we're live now. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our school committee meeting of this Wednesday night, April 3rd, 2019. Um, thank you all for being here. I'll remind everybody that we are being recorded, recorded for future rebroadcast, but we are not live tonight. Um, but you still need to behave, please. Thank you. Um, could you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, so first up, we have our student representatives. We have Katie and Laney. Could you please join us? If you could please just introduce yourselves and give us your grades for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lainey Bean from seventh grade. Um, hi, I'm Katie Huff, from also from seventh grade. We are students from the Douglas Middle School here to catch everybody up to date with the recent events within our school. First off, let's dive into upcoming events. Vacation will be here soon. There is no school from the 15th to the 19th. The students are ready for break, but are also looking forward to Spirit Week. This starts on the week of April 8th to, to the 12th. Each day there is a different theme. The themes are Music Day, Movie Day, Hollywood Day, Volleyball, and The Talent Show. Next, let's get into sports. Many students are excited to be involved in spring sports, and they are off to a great start. There are over 40 students on the middle school track team. The experienced runners and track event people have stepped up to help others and try to teach them. The new track team is adjusting and all the students are getting to know each other. These students are one big family when it comes to the meets and practices. The first track meet is Thursday, April 11th. The members of the team have decided what events they will be competing in for the first meet. High school varsity and JV baseball and softball have also started and included some seventh and eighth graders. Seven boys made the JV team and had their first game today at the high school. Nine girls also made the JV softball team and also had their first game. In other after school activities, the yearbook club has been working diligently to gather all of the memories of this year and put them together. Students have already started ordering their yearbooks and can't wait to see all the funny, memorable images captured throughout the year. Student Council has also been hard at work. This group has been doing their best to make sure Spirit Week is a complete success this year. They have planned out each day in the week scheduled and are making all the students have a fun week and feel appreciated. The eighth grade class officers have created communities to start planning the dinner dance, which is taking place during the last week of school. The committee has been taking their time to make sure that the eighth graders have a great last dance as middle schoolers. After vacation, MCAS will begin on April 25th and 26th with 7th and 8th graders both taking their ELA test. 6th graders will test on the 29th and 30th. The teachers are preparing the students and making sure they have all the knowledge necessary to succeed. Moving into the academics, it is great to say that middle school students continue to try to complete their work best. Amplifying the March character trait of studious, report card documents have been visible on iPass since March 18th. Third trimester is underway and we are heading into the home stretch of the year. The first round of acceptance letters were received last week from some eighth graders from BBT. All the students have been doing very well and have been thriving as a community. We would like to thank you for having us tonight and have a great meeting. I mean evening. And meeting. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Great job as always, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, so uh, we're now at our public comment and communication section. Um, the school committee welcomes public comment on items that are within the scope of the school committee's responsibilities, but not on our agenda tonight. Is there anything, anyone here for anything not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Um, at this point, I would like to entertain a motion to take our agenda a bit out of order as we have um, some folks here for an item wait on our agenda for the DMS um, eighth grade class trip. I'll make a motion to move the eighth grade class trip up to public comment. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Lisa, a second from Julian. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Come on up, ladies. Thank you. And if you just please introduce yourselves for us, please. Hello, 
my name is Chloe Jo Basim. And I'm Emma Kamasi, and we are eighth grade, two of the eighth grade class officers. The eighth grade would like to do would like to take a field trip to Canopy Lake Park as culminating middle as a culminating middle school event. We are planning on going June 10th. The park is located at 85 North Policy Street in Salem, New Hampshire. It will take approximately one hour and 15 minutes to get there by bus. We will be leaving Douglas Middle School at 7.30 and returning at 4.15. All students will be required to ride, the canopy, ride to Canopy and back on the buses provided. Parents will be picking up their children at 4.15 from Douglas Middle School. We will reserve buses with Silver Fox Bus Company and tickets will be ordered as soon as the trip is approved. And the final ticket number will be finalized upon arrival. The cost for admittance to the park will be $25 per person. The total cost of the buses is $2,045. PTO and class deals will be used to offset the cost of the trip. There are also additional funds available for any student with financial hardship. The cost per child will not exceed $38. The student to chaperone ratio will be approximately 12 to 1. We will be meeting with all chaperones prior to the trip to explain the responsibilities that day of the field trip. The students will check in with their chaperones every two hours at a centrally located place by the water. Our nurse will be located at this spot throughout the day. Thank you. Any questions? This is an annual trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's been a success in the past. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's some other discussion. I would interested in a motion on this. Just to approve that. Uh, yeah, so I said to approve the proposal for the eighth grade field trip to Canopy Lake Park in Salem, New Hampshire. So moved. So we have a motion from Jillian. Second. And a second from Lisa. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank, Thank you fun. so much. So at this point, we'll move into our FY 2020 open budget public hearing. Um, so is this, are we going to start the slideshow now? Okay, yes. so we're going to slide over this table to the right here. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, we're going to do an overview of the school department budget. Uh, the FY 2020 House 2 Governor's Budget Chapter 70 increase was $24,540. That represents $20 per student, or 0.28% increase. Um, in the FY 2020 budget, we are recommending the use of $2,826,076 to be used from revolving funds and grants as budgetary offsets. This includes school choice tuition, circuit breaker reimbursement, athletic fees, music fees, preschool tuition, and grants. <clears throat> the FY 2020 superintendent's budget was first presented to the school committee on February 6th. On March 6th, we, represent, we presented a revised school department budget that included net reductions in the amount of $139,859 and an additional use of revolving funds in the amount of $141,691. We have again updated the um, FY20 budget for the public hearing and approval by the school committee, uh, hopefully this evening, to reflect a budget in the amount of $13,589,000 $970, which represents a 2% increase over the FY 2019 appropriation. And to get to that amount, we, it required an additional $154,141 in, re, in reductions. The school district is relying more heavily on school choice tuition revenue and special <coughs> education circuit breaker reimbursements, thereby reducing the school department's flexibility, financial flexibility, flexibility to deal with issues as they arise throughout the fiscal and school year. These balances will continue to de decrease and will not be able to rely on to this extent in future years. Okay, so for budgetary challenges under the heading of local issues, out of district and in district special education expenditures to rise. Every district in, in the, in the uh, state is dealing with special education in and out of district matters. It is absolutely not unique to Douglas. It does have financial impacts, 
we are in fact governed and obligated and it is the right thing to do to make sure that we provide FAPE for all students. We have been proactive, we've been responsive, and we've implemented some new programs, some delivery systems, supports, all for the benefit of making sure that our students' needs are being met and that we are able to accommodate them within our district whenever possible. A number of new initi initiatives are the, um, have been implemented, as I said. It is the right thing to do. It is appropriate for us to do so, and it is responsive to our student needs. Out of district, I mean, sorry, our town capacity to fund education at an adequate level is limited. As we've gone through this process, as Ms. Keegan just mentioned, we started out at a total better than $14 million. We have endeavored to get down to a level service, level staff budget, which was a 3.16 percentage increase or $13,744,111. We are now at a 2% tonight which is at $13,589,970. We ensure the public that we will continue to offer strong academics and strong programs at this 2% budget. And lastly, the inability to fund education at sustainable levels that will move the district forward is likely to continue to have a negative impact on both the town and school finances due to students attending other schools. We are in a very competitive region. If we are unable to offer strong academic programs, given the region that we live in, students will exercise choice. We have, we have proposed and are trying to implement a number of new programs, for example, an early college program here at the high school and many others. The plan to move the district forward was a short-term innovative plan that we, we felt would keep the district competitive. The plan was for it to remain competitive within the, the Blackstone Valley as well as across Central Mass. Um, the failure to increase beyond the 2% will not allow us to continue the momentum we began two years ago and again this year where we've implemented some additional classes. So the biggest concern here would be the inability to continue to implement and, and, and uh, gain momentum in our competitiveness. So. Okay, the next slide is showing you the special education tuition costs in the general fund circuit breaker reimbursement account, and also um, we have several grants um, that cover, well, we have one grant that covers on um, tuitions as well. So the reason that I prepared this slide is to show that, and as Mr. Maines indicated, our district is no different than any other school district with regard to the exorbitant costs and how much they've increased, particularly in recent years. So this shows you the huge difference, and it also shows not only the increase um, over the years, but um, even more importantly for budget planning purposes, uh, you can see how widely they change as well. Um, now with regard to circuit breaker um, reimbursement, that is um, state revenue that uh, is uh, legislatively supposed to be funded at 75%, but is always subject to appropriation, those, those three key, very key words. And um, the way it works is it's per, student. So say for instance you had a um, special ed tuition for $100,000. They have approximately $50,000 comes off and they call it a foundation amount that comes off of that. That leaves you only $50,000 that is even subject or eligible for um, circuit breaker reimbursement and of that there's up to 75%. Now there's only one year that I recall, I actually have a spreadsheet that indicates um, the trend over a number of years, I think I began it in 2010, so it's been for nine years. I believe one time it was actually funded at 75% during those years. Um, typically it's around 63, 65%, uh, typically in that area. Um, and you can carry over up to the amount that you receive in a particular year into the following year. The reason for that is so that they allow you some flexibility legislatively so that you can keep some of those, maintain some of those funds for some of the unexpected expenditures that come in the following year. And I can tell you, and uh, Mrs. Urquhart can certainly back me up with this, that you don't know day to day what can come up with special education. Um, we are here to serve all of our students, um, special education, regular education, it doesn't make, it makes no difference what their needs are, that's what we are here for. So this kind of at least shows you um, with regard to the um, 
financial aspect of it, how difficult it is and how much of a burden that has become financially anyway um, in trying to um, budget for that accordingly. This next slide is, the, um, is really the, the nexus of everything that we're looking to talk about this evening. Um, it has been discussed at, at, at previous meetings as well. You can see at the very top in that first box uh, the positions that were considered and were, were implemented in the Move the District Forward Plan two years ago. Um, they had not been implemented at, at this time. The hope was that some, if not all of those positions, uh, could have been implemented into the budget for this year. Um, we knew that that would be, that would be uh, aggressive, but we were hoping that continue the momentum and be able to implement some of those positions to continue moving the district forward. Again, going back to the issue of, of our competitiveness, um, one of the things that was critical when we presented the district moving forward was that we wanted to be able to ensure that there would be stability and more importantly, sustainability. And that meaning that we would be able to continue to make incremental gains each year and, and continue to improve the district's academic and progr uh, programs across all buildings. So. You can see the, 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 the offerings that were up there, a, a Spanish position, a, a .2 Spanish position at the, at the primary school, uh, a STEM position at the elementary school, a STEM position at the middle school, uh, academic center at the middle school, phys ed, health teacher, uh, biology, animal, animal plant science, possibly math teacher. Um, we, we've become very good at, at having people do a number of things. Um, proposal to add a part-time athletic trainer and a technology uh, request to replace 25 of the PCs that are original to the building, which is 15 years, I believe. That sound about right? 14 years, there it is. So um, now, in those proposals were things that would support some of the initiatives that we've talked about, which would be distance learning, uh, linked directly to the Blackstone Valley Superintendent's Consortium, uh, a very ambitious program that's, out, uh, that's, that's just beginning and that we've had a, uh, an important part in. Uh, student internship programs related to coursework, uh, an early college program, a revised 6 through 10 health curriculum that would address not only health issues but also social emotional well-beings, um, some new electives that would be offered at Douglas High School to address the Mass Core component, and the, uh, the hope to bring animal science and plant science to the high school which would afford us the opportunity to um, provide our students with hands-on experiences in the area of horticulture as well as working on a, on a local farm and, and giving them some, some great opportunities to learn about those two fields. It was a three to five year plan as I mentioned. We uh, were hoping for, to maintain the momentum. Um, as of right now, uh, we don't see that any of these positions can be implemented unless there's a change in the appropriation that the, that, the, that the school district receives. So having said that, that $290,000, $290,400 comes right off the top. And as Courtney mentioned, we had to go back in and make some additional reductions. We were, we were charged by the school committee to try to get, as well as the finance committee, to try to get to what would be considered a level staffed level service budget and that is a 3.16 increase, or $13,744,111. In order to get to that number, we have made some additional cuts. We have reduced uh, three part-time support positions, a reduction of a 0. .6, or a reduction of 0. .6 in our faculty, or um, Mr. Mayor, teaching staff. Yep. Can I interrupt? I'm sorry. Yep. I, th I think those cuts are what take you from the 3.16 down. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. So I, I think the... You know, the things that yeah. you would remove to get to that or the, the things that get you the button, get you right? there, right? Yeah. My, my fault, yep. And then, um, so then to get down to the, the, to the uh, appropriation, the 2% the appropriation, I should have said thank you, um, we made these cuts. So again, uh, three position, part time positions, a 0.6 faculty position, uh, some stipend positions, textbooks, and Chromebooks. So uh, let me talk a little bit about that real quickly. So these three part time positions um, have proven to be. Um, great additions this year. They are really proving to be very beneficial. Um, we like to refer to them as value added. Uh, unfortunately, they will go. The point six will have to be determined with, with a, uh, by the administrative team as to have the least adverse impact on our classrooms. The stipend positions will actually impact the high school 
um, in its ability to get some supportive, supportive leadership for Mr. Vega and Mr. Romano. Um, the textbooks will be coming uh, out of the high school. Uh, that will, again, be uh, a setback, which we have not been able to add them over the last couple of years. And, and probably the most significant is the uh, reduction of the one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative, which was the next phase of our technology implementation plan at Douglas Middle School, which also trickles down and impacts Douglas Elementary School because the set, the, the class set of Chromebooks, I'm sorry, the one-to-one -one Chromebooks at the middle school were sl slated to be transitioned down to the elementary along with any of the viable iPads that we still have at the middle school going down to um, the elementary school. So the Chromebook initiative, therefore, uh, is, is also in this, this uh, rotation of cuts. So as you can see, there's some pretty significant impacts here, but it does get us to where we needed to get to, which is the 2% appropriation. It's really hard to see this from the side. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm getting a little bit uh, seasick here. OK. All right, so. Did you want to talk about if there was a 1%? Oh, so. Yeah, I guess um, going back is very difficult. If I had to go to 1% with the additional cut of $133,235, that would have to come from programs or faculty position. When we say programs, it could be athletics, it could be drama club, it could be band chorus, um, try to least impact as many programs as possible, or it would be an additional 2.6 six or two point yeah two point six faculty positions to get to the one percent at right as of right now we are looking at the two percent okay okay I go I went one too many I gotta go back now oh boy I can do it though did it. <laughs> I used to use this for first day PowerPoint, first day PowerPoint right here, and I'd always get lost. Okay, so here we have um, maintaining the current 2019 staffing um, in levels district-wide. At the 2%, the, you, you, I just mentioned that the reductions would be some part-time staffing and also the, possible, the reduction of a 0.6 FTEs in uh, classroom instruction or support instruction. So other than that, we are able to maintain the staffing levels across the district. Athletic and co-curricular programs district-wide at 2%, we are able to hold on to these programs and maintain the fee structure. If we did get to the 1%, as I just mentioned, it is very possible that the athletic programs at, at, at both schools that have athletics or band chorus or other programs would definitely be impacted there. Uh, we are maintaining our athletic fees uh, at $200 per sport for DHS and $175 for Douglas Middle School. Again, there still are no caps attached to that. And I believe that the boosters, uh, we, I don't know if you've heard from the boosters as to whether they're going to continue to support it at the high school. They have over the years supported um, the uh, athletic fees. Uh, does not include any new programs to enhance the educational offerings for students. Uh, again, related to our competitiveness with other districts. As I mentioned, uh, we talked about the issue of competitiveness, the issue of momentum. The one thing that I would categorically like to state is that uh, in, in, in with having the representatives in the building, Central Mass is a up-and-coming, burgeoning region. Um, academically, very competitive school districts within, the, within Central Massachusetts, a great deal of innovation but more importantly, a great deal of collaboration between the districts. The 13 districts work really well together. Um, Mr. Romano has been intimately involved in some of this work. We are really work looking to, to take Central Mass to a new level academically and program-wise in being a leader. And in that, we're talking about things like distance learning. Um, the early college program, of which we have, uh, Mr. Romano has already begun a program with uh, Uxbridge and is it Northbridge? I forget what the other school is. Yep, and in working with uh, QCC as, as well as Becker to offer our students opportunities to take courses while they're in, in high school and they're in college credits. Um, there's a, uh, a, a plan for a distance learning activity coming forward out of the Blackstone Valley Superintendents Consortium 
which we hope to implement for next year. It will also link directly into the Education Hub, which is associated with the Blackstone Valley Educational Foundation. So really a lot of cutting edge stuff here and a lot of common ideas, common shared values of what we want to do for central Massachusetts. And I think it's really becoming an extremely competitive region. And we want to be part of that. We want to be part of that. Um, along that lines, it does not include um, additional resources to maintain buildings and grounds. Um, one of the areas that is hit here is, is the um, field and grounds. There's a, there's a reduction in its supply line, materials line, of $7,700. Uh, that will directly relate to the quality of our grounds and the quality of our field space. Uh, but we are in a position where we needed to make cuts, and uh, that is one of the areas where we had. Our fields do get excessive use, and as such, my concern is that because of it make, having to make a cut here again, as we have done in previous years, that it might compromise our field space. And then as Mrs. Uh, Ms. Keegan mentioned about the revolving funds, it's clearly not sustainable. Um, an additional 141,691 just recently added into it. As she mentioned, a total of 2.8 million plus that's being used. I would, I would credit the school committee for maintaining their commitment that they made to two years, ensuring stability within the district. There is a breaking point, there is a tipping point. But in doing the additional um, appropriation of the, the, the $141,000, this is one of the reasons why we are able to stay whole and maintain our programs. So again, the school committee realized that and has again honored their statement of, a, of two years ago and we appreciate that from them. So the proposed updated um, FY 2020 general fund budget summary net of use of the revolving funds, grants, donations, and fees that we have enumerated. Um, and this, this is just a very brief summary, but we do have a copy here for those of you um, uh, sitting in the audience. Um, I believe you all have a copy of it, and that's actually a detailed, very detailed budget. But this is just a summary. We have district-wide budget, the amount of 1,593,924. The primary school, 1,524,995. The elementary school, $3,108,085. Middle school, $2,841,520. And the high school, $4,521,446. Total again, $13,589,970. Again, 2% increase. Um, and again, we can't say this enough that it does not include the moving the district forward expenditures that Mr. Maines um, enumerated a few slides uh, previous. And again, the exorbitant use of um, all of the revolving funds. Certainly we're being, we're not being so aggressive that we're not mindful of keeping some balance there for anything that may come up so that we can respond. But we had a lot of discussion, a lot of deliberation and careful analysis of all the information that we had available to us and in kind of looking forward as well to look at you know red flags and, and things of that nature in order to come up with that figure but I can say that as a business manager um, and everybody knows I would never I'm always prudently conservative I wouldn't recommend doing anything that was um, uh, reckless but certainly uh, it does does make you feel a little bit uncomfortable looking beyond next year um, because it's just not sustainable but again, you're left with the choice of utilizing more of the revolving funds or do you allow from not using them going backwards from whence we came and we all know what that looked like. And we don't want to go backwards. We've made a lot of really good headway. We've, we've done a, some wonderful things the last few years. The main thing in FY18, if you'll recall, was to, main, to get the stability back, to stabilize the district. In FY18, it was the first time in years that we did not have any staff reductions. In 19, we maintained that as well again. And with some very strategic additions from the, um, again, thank you to the school committee. Um, in the beginning, right before school started in FY19, as you recall, we added a few things, but not much. Um, but again, to move a little bit forward, but we don't want to lose that momentum. That's really the key thing that we want to get across. It's very, very crucial to maintain the momentum and don't go back from, excuse my putting it this way, but from whence we came, because mm -hmm. we, we've, we've been there and 
um, done that for a number of years. Um, with regard to transportation, we have regular ed transportation at $891,036. That's an estimated 6% increase. We will be going out to bid, so that was um, kind of the estimate that the town administrator had recommended using based on the prior year's increase. And then we have special ed transportation, the amount of $702,351. You can see there's a, a large increase there. But what I want to, um, I do want to speak a little bit about transportation. There has been, there have been some statements made with regard to um, looking at the overall transportation as if I think a lot of people were um, taking it to mean that it's the regular buses driving through town picking up, you know, the students, that it was going up by almost 18 percent. And as you can clearly see, it's two completely different things. The regular ed transportation is your in-district, um, just, you know, going back and forth to school. Special ed transportation is a number of, of transportation for special education students. And it is to out-of-district placements. They can be located in many, many different towns. They can be quite a distance away. It's also for um, vocational activities. It's for field trip activities. It also includes the in-district special ed education. Okay, so even though you're looking at that percentage, as Jean Lovett and I, the finance director of town accountant, and I always say, there's always a story behind the numbers. And the story is far more important than looking at the numbers. And I wanted to make that clarification as that has been, um, I think, uh, a little bit, I don't want to say misstated, but maybe just misinformed with regard to um, how the transportation works. Um, so, okay, moving forward. We're just showing you again, I'm actually showing you the detail with regard to, this is a circuit breaker. I'm showing you the actual fund balance brought forward on July 1st, 2018. The projected revenue for FY19, the budgeted expenditures for FY19 um, through what I know today, and the projected, that's why I underline it, projected as of June 30th, we expect to carry over into FY20, which is the budget that we're talking about this evening. $739,947. And as you can see, I always put a large disclaimers because things do change. So we do project carrying that balance over, and these were the figures that we were looking at with regard to utilizing um, additional uh, circuit breaker revenue. We expect to carry forward that balance, and the projected revenue we expect to take in in FY20, we're just actually looking to use just that amount and ending with the same um, uh, fund balance at the end of FY20. We didn't take as much out of the circuit breaker because certainly that's where we have a lot of um, volatility, for lack of a better word, and um, we wanted to be very prudently conservative with regard to that. We did use a little bit more, but it's really more in the school choice tuition that we were looking at with regard to the additional um, revenue that we use, and also preschool tuition as well. Um, so that kind of gives you the detail there. And the next slide is the school choice tuition. Again, the same information, what's being brought over into FY19, the current fiscal year. The projected revenues, the expenditures um, projected to use this year with an ending balance that we will be carrying over into the FY20 uh, budget year, $1,037,147. And you can see um, we have quite a large number there that that's really where we're, like I said, that we're really kind of hitting more. Um, and then we have a projected ending balance of 541,147. Um, and I do keep trend um, histories on uh, both of those accounts. That's something I really have to watch very carefully. So I have the actuals from 2010 all the way through projections uh, for 19 and 20. Um, so we can monitor our use and, and look at um, where we've been in the past and, and where we're going forward. So again, a large use, uh, you know, we don't feel so uncomfortable that otherwise we would not have recommended it, but certainly it is getting, it's getting lower and it isn't sustainable going forward, so. Um, okay, the next slide. Okay, this slide here is just showing you um, beginning FY 2005 and through FY 2019, um, the operating budget is the bar, the red bar is going up and down. You can see how that hasn't been. It hasn't been increasing a great amount, as you can see, over the past, God, since FY 2012. Um, you can see that the town revenue has been increasing more since 2012. 
as far as what the town contributes towards the overall school budget. And the blue is the um, state revenue. And you can see that's been pretty well flatlined since um, FY 2012. Uh, generally, what we've been receiving um, is the, the $20, or so sometimes it can be more than that per student. But in the interest of full disclosure, we have had declining enrollment in that um, I will say that we are lucky in one way that the hold harmless agreement actually keeps it where we are receiving at least the amount we, we received in the prior year. So we're not getting hit for the declining enrollment. So it's really not that aspect, aspect of the Chapter 70 that's at issue here. Because we do appreciate the fact that the legislature has been funding and has been um, keeping to the extent possible the hold harmless agreement, or otherwise we would be losing probably a million or more dollars because of the declining enrollment. But that being said, the biggest issue with regard to Chapter 70 is the fact that the formula itself, as we all have spoken about many times, has not changed in many, many years, but there has been a foundation um, review commission. They have come out with some recommendations, um, but as you all know, everything is those three words that I not so fond of unless it's appropriated, but subject to appropriation. So they are looking at, there are some things afoot, and maybe um, Senator Fatman or um, Representative Joe McKenna may want to speak more to that later on. There are some things afoot to attempt to address some of those issues. The two largest are special education, um, the amount that they had in the foundation um, budget for school districts. It's far, far, far lower than the actual expenditures that we have been spending year after year after year for many, many years. So they do have that information, that data available. Again, it comes out to whether or not the legislature um, can and, and has the intestinal fortitude, I guess, um, as well to, to fund that um, at adequate levels. So that's really the largest problem with regard to that. Um, Just quick, quick question. Certainly. SF, SF funds, could you remind us what that is in the footnote? Oh, yes. Do we really want to talk about that? Yes. Just to, just Those were lovely years. We don't have to go into That's details, when they just... had a large reduction in um, Chapter 70 in those particular years. But they found, um, between federal and state government, they found these um, stabilization funds stabilization. to okay. equal out what it would have been in Chapter 70. Okay. And that's why it's put together. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have to remind me of those Ooh, years? Uh, oh, they were terrible years. Um, but basically, that's what this is showing here. And the next slide here, again, as I, I just enumerated, um, you're looking at the uh, Douglas Public School student enrollment trend. In FY 2006, we had 1,746 students, and now we're down to 1,296 1, uh, students. So it's pretty stable right through FY 2010. So a little bit of a decrease between 11 and 12, and you've seen it steadily decrease from FY 13 through 19, which exactly corresponds to our budgetary woes. Mm -hmm. So. Right. And the next slide will show some of that. But one other thing that I would like to suggest here is that um, we've seen an increase in, in students attending um, private schools. And also, uh, as I mentioned just a minute ago, because the region is becoming so competitive and there are choice options, students and parents are exercising their choice within the region. So this next slide will show you um, where we are with regards to uh, students attending other schools, including School Choice Out, Blackstone Valley, North Fork Aggie. Um, and it does talk a little bit about our declining enrollments. Uh, demographics is one part of it. There is clearly a de decrease in population. But there are other reasons. And this chart is really actually beneficial. If you take a look at the receiving school choice, um, at, at 2000. 12, 13, we were at 110. Uh, those who've been around know that in 13, 14, we, uh, we implemented the MIMSI, the AP uh, program here at the high school that was expanded to 14 courses. So a lot of students in the, in the uh, valley come, come to us, maintained it in 14, 15. You can see the cliff in, in 15, 16, where there's a significant drop. We bounced back a little bit, 16, 17. Um, the fear before the, um, the, the, in, in 17, 18, was that we were going over the cliff, uh, a, a noticeable drop in, in, in school choice in, thanks to the school committee, and then also the override, we uh, saw a nice jump back, and students want to come to Douglas. We do have a lot of great things going here, and they do want to come back to Douglas, and an increase of 19, as you can see, from 17, 18 to 18, 19. 
Sending has, ha has been um, going through a similar trend in, in 40 there, in, I'm sorry, in, in, in 12, 13, there was 40. Uh, you can see that the high point was 17, 18, which corresponds to the low point in coming in. And then you can see that we've uh, had a decrease from 17, 18 to this year with 67. The, the piece that is interesting is the private school. Um, 12, 13, there were only 64 students attending private schools. You look at 18, 19, there's 130. So you can see in the last three years, there's been a noticeable jump to private schools, and I believe that that is more at the elementary level than it is at the high school level, although we are seeing an increase at the high school level. Uh, BVT um, from 12, 13 to where we are now, we know it's a big jump. Um, we seem to have leveled off a little bit on our acceptances. Norfolk Aggie um, high point was last year at, uh, I'm sorry, 17, 18. Yeah, last year was eight. Uh, this year it's six. We know that three are graduating, but we have three people who have applied. Should they get accepted, it would be that we would remain the same. So um, the enrollment number, as you can see, from 12, 13 to 18, 19 is a decrease of 361 or 21.8% presently in 1819. Okay, um, key thoughts. So key points for thoughtful consideration. I already talked about the Chapter 70 level funding, um, minimal funding, but we do have the um, hold harmless provision. Uh, and again, you know, and thank you to the, to the taxpayers and residents of Douglas. The FY 2019, um, the override allowed the school department to level fund its budget. Without the override, the school department would have been required to reduce $643,670 in FY19. And that would have had um, Detriment. an overstating saying disastrous consequences because Detriment. after what it was like the year before, um, it really would have been. However, this did not include any additions to move the district forward, but we did appreciate what we did receive. Um, and as stated earlier, there has been a positive turnaround <clears throat> in the school choice in, school choice out and other out-of-district schools with positive financial impacts for both the town and the school department. And we'd like to continue that trend as well. Um, continuing to fund the school department at, at levels that sustain the district moving forward will continue to have an overall positive impact, financial impact. But more importantly, moving the district forward will continue to have a positive impact on all of our students' educational opportunities and academic success, and that's why we are here. And so the last one is just an update on the, on the time schedule. So as you can see tonight is the um, public hearing for the school budget. The school department appropriation is still to be determined, work to be done. There will be a lot of focus meetings with the administrative team to make decisions relative to our final uh, appropriation. And we will do that, as I mentioned earlier, to ensure that we're providing the best student experiences that we can across all grade levels. Uh, May 6th is the annual town meeting. It will take place right here as well. Um, and then the school committee final budget will eventually be posted on the uh, public school website once it is completely finalized, as it always has been. And that is the budget proposed budget presentation. Thank you. Any questions from our audience on any of this? Probably should have paused halfway through for that because you get a question ten minutes ago, you probably forgot it, right? <laughs> but um, or comments either. I will know again that most of our audience is our school administration, which is, once again, not, not to say the folks that are here that aren't administration aren't appreciated. We do greatly appreciate you, more so because of the low numbers, but um, I, I would so greatly like to be out here one night and see 50 or so parents um, rather than the two that we have here. Um, but thank you for being here. But no questions? Okay. So with that, I think we'll... Sorry, Becky. So, uh, just state your name. With regards um, to what, if, 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 specifically, if, specifically to the out of district special education piece, I think that that's the part that which is just yeah.
we have some people that might be able yeah, to help said, us I think, I think you're getting a little bit <laughs> in that conversation <laughs> present. Yeah, um, yeah, right. um, <laughs> not that I, not that we want to point any fingers, but yeah. Um, um, but I, I think it's it's a combination of things. Um, you know, we're 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 going to have a vote later tonight on on our our school bus um, contract and, and um, potentially reduce the number of, of routes there. Um, it's you know might cause well, we hope minimal pain there. Um, for our students, but it might save us some money that we could then reinvest back into the district. There's things like that. There are things like the consortium of, of the um, yep. 13 surrounding school districts that um, Mr. Maines and Mr. Romano have been working on that have minimal cost but have, could have a tremendous benefit to our school as well as the other surrounding schools. Um, and I think a lot of the rest of that answer, again, I think lies in, in, in our next discussion. I think that's, that's the, the next place. The, the residents have come forward um, it, you know, with the override last year. It's, it's you know, bought us some time, but it's, it's, we're only a few years from being back to where we were um, you know, before the override, unfortunately. Um, so I don't, that's a bullet we can count on again any time in the near future. Right. And, no? you know, the override, um, we're just one year after the override, as you can see. We're we're making some reductions, um, and they're, and they're hurtful, um, and they do they will have impacts. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm not sure if we did this right, but um, I think we had a motion to close our open hearing. Is that, should we have had a motion to open our our open hearing? Um, but I, I, will, I will take a motion to close our open hearing at this point. I'll make a motion to close our open hearing. Our, our open budget public hearing. Our Thank open you. budget public okay. hearing. Motion from Jillian. Second. Second from Lisa. Any other discussion? Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Okay. At this time, I would like to welcome up Senator Fatman and Representative McKenna to the table to join us, please. Thank you. Um, so, gentlemen, I think we're going to do a couple things. I ask Mr. Maines to put together just um. Um, a bit of a reminder, kind of where we. I think I think you saw a lot of it, you know, through our our, our budget hearing there. Some some of the history, but um, a little bit high level, kind of from from our low point, which I think was our our FY 15, 16, 16. Seven, yeah, 15, 16, FY 16 year. What we've been able to do since then, um, and just to kind of as, as a refresher, um, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of you know again some of the struggles and, and where we're at. And then just opened up to a more open discussion with you around what, what's happening at the state, what things you can, um, you know, we should be doing in your eyes, and, and how we can work together to tell, help Douglas. Sure. So the, the, I'll, I'll go really quickly through this. I know it's a lot of stuff, but I was trying to hurry through this. I started it at about two o'clock, and, and here it is. It's up. So um, it, it, it's it's first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, I know that you've been privy to what has been going on over the years. Um, so. We were back in 15, 16. We had a number of reductions. Support staff were re reduced. Class sizes were impacted. Um, high, uh, middle school special and elementary and primary school specials, which our classroom instruction were, were cut in half. Um, our fee structure went up. Uh, our participation level went down a little bit. Um, we eliminated with the. We made the decision to eliminate funding for athletics, which was very, very difficult. We only survived that because of the work of the boosters. We made, we added fees to our band program. We only survived that because of the boosters as well in 15-16. 16-17, again, the boosters continued to support our athletics and our band and choral programs. Uh, again, some continued uh, reductions in our staffing across the district. Again, class size issues continued to show. Uh, additional cuts in supplies, materials, textbooks. I don't. I don't think that, that when I was at the high school, I don't think we bought textbooks for four years. Um, no ancillary materials as well. Our choice out students. Um, we had 15 students leave more than 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 in, in, than previous year. And again, choice in had decreased. Clearly, people were saying um, it's a sinking ship. You know, you, you've got to go. As, as Brett mentioned, the low point, 15, 16, 16, 17, I don't think it could have gotten any lower. Uh, we did at the, um, in, in, the, in uh, December receive a one-time funds that we were able to use to, to buy some of the supplies and materials that were originally cut. And towards the very end of the school year, May 1, on the, on the town meeting, we received an appropriation of $140,000 $140, because the town was in danger of not meeting that school spending. Uh, that was used to purchase some textbooks and ancillary materials finally 
at that point in time. That was 1617. 1718, the school committee, as I mentioned, made the decision to greater utilize the funds that were available and revolving, taking a calculated risk. Uh, it was a two-year plan. It was the first time, as Ms. Keegan just mentioned before, the first time without any staff reductions. We added a Title I math position, which was desperately needed. We increased our music at the middle school by 0.5 to make it a 1.0, but really it was 2.5 people, but we were able to do, we were able to increase our music offerings. We expanded the high school um, media department by 0.4 to make that position once again a full-time position. I should mention, gentlemen, that all of those positions had been cut. These are slowly re-implementing uh, re them back into what we had. And then we added 1.5 in, the, in the regards to the classroom teaching positions specifically for the purpose of addressing class size concerns that had been building over years. The fees were reduced to 225 with regards to athletics. Uh, we introduced the Moving the District Forward Plan, uh, presented as a short-term uh, support plan for academic opportunities and also program opportunities for our students, again with the idea of competitiveness. 1819, the override of 1.5 million, as Ms. Keegan mentioned, 600,000 plus to help us to uh, stave off uh, further uh, impl uh, implications on our, what we do. Um, first iteration of moving the district forward, we were able to add an adjustment counselor at the high school and the elementary school. Um, the, the, you, you're both very well aware of what social emotional concerns are that are in schools and so forth now. Um, to think that Douglas High School did not have an adjustment counselor in its building until 2018. Uh, although it had been recommended for many, many years. Same thing with the elementary school. It was a shared position. Um, it was catastrophic, and, and, and it, was about, it was something that was desperately needed and has paid huge dividends, both those positions. We added the .5 nurse at the elementary school uh, to address some uh, medical needs that were uh, uh, showed themselves there. Uh, we added 1.5 FT in special uh, positions, so basically 3.5 positions at the middle school. We're expanded to 3.5, uh, with we're expanded to 3.1.0 positions, uh, very, and, and we also were able to offer additional courses with that. Uh, the fee structure has remained stable, and there were no position and no program cuts. Which brings us to 2019-20, year two of the override. We are we have virtually no additions with regards to positions. Uh, that were linked into the moving the district forward. We've cut $70,000 out of supply lines. The school committee has used another $141,000 to get us stable, to keep us from making cuts. They've used 2.826 million, I'm sorry, 2.86, I'll try it again, $2.8 million to keep us solvent and stable. We're making cuts to some part-time support positions, some stipend positions, some textbooks. We've eliminated a one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative, which was the next phase of a plan that we had in place. We will have to reduce 0.5 of our faculty somewhere along the lines. There are no new academic offerings linked to moving the district forward. The Blackstone Valley Consortium, Superintendent's Consortium, uh, we will begin some shared learning opportunities linked to manufacturing. Uh, we will be working with the Ed Hub next year. We do have an early co college program going underway. Um, we also have the possible expansion of pre-K, and we also have the possible need of a kindergarten teacher uh, due to some enrollment increases. And those are the quick overviews. Great. Thank you, Mr. Right Mintz. There. Scott, if you could shut that off, Scott. Yes. Thank Please. you. <laughs> Any questions on any of that or anything that you saw during the, uh, you know, the budget? Um, I went quickly because I know you guys have been around and you've been listening to it, yeah. so I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't think we have any questions specific to what you're facing, but I don't know if you want to kick off what's going on with the state. Yeah, um, thank you very much for all the information. It's very, very helpful for us and um, greatly appreciate the invite uh, allowing us to come tonight. Um, somewhat timely just because I had my meeting today with um, Mike Rodericks, who's the chair of Ways and Means, and fortunately they provide every senator and usually every representative the ability to sit down and kind of get an understanding of where things are at. Um, I've been to several school committee meetings uh, over the course of the last three months, and one of the things that I've talked a lot about was, you know, House 1, which is the governor's budget that always kicks off the budget process is always, I think, and, um, you know, 
under promise type budget um, or you know they don't want to over promise and under deliver and I think that we have a governor who's particularly cautious in that sometimes really frustratingly so um, but I was told today in the Senate meeting uh, with Ways and Means that towns would be very happy uh, about circuit breaker regional school transportation chapter 70 because that the Senate due to the chapter 70 discussions that have been going on ad nauseum year after year after year was planning on making a big statement with regards to how we fund education in the Commonwealth and so that was really um, exceptional you know some of those conversations included full funding of the circuit breaker reimbursement the highest level of regional school transportation ever um, you know obviously it will be the highest amount for chapter 70 is kind of just a talking point at this point but you know I would suspect based on what I heard the numbers that you have will at least double um, just for chapter 70 if not more than that with the Senate budget and um, you know one of the things that also will help the town of Douglas financially is pilot payments uh, because you know last year Senator Rodericks who has um, oh geez what is it Horseneck Beach in his district uh, had, and that's a really good thing for anybody who has large parcels of state-owned land uh, because now he's chairman of Ways and Means and he saw his community lose about three hundred thousand dollars in funding because of the way pilot payments were going so he was able to put $2 million back into that. The good news is that the governor has actually annualized that into his budget, which hasn't got a lot of attention, but it is very good news for the town of Douglas because I remember receiving a very uh, thoughtful yet nasty letter from the Board of Selectmen saying, what the heck are you guys doing up there? Like, look at what's happened to the, um, the pilot payments. Uh, Joe and I spent a lot of time on the phone with DOR and um, DCR because DOR is part of um, the equation and uh, one of the things that they conveyed to us which we have conveyed to the assessor's office is don't devalue that land uh, that is very important not to do because that has a direct impact on the, the pilot payments and so if we can find within the realms of the law a way to make that land valuable that's really important um, and so hopefully we're not going to see any sort of uh, hit there which I think is, uh, you know, sort of this idea of moving forward, a really important one. Um, Becky, Becky, you asked a really complicated question. So this is the first year I've served on the Ways and Means. We have a $42 billion budget. About 46% of that budget is made up of health care costs completely. We have 1.8 million people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that are on state subsidized health care. We have 6.5 million residents that live here. Um, that's that's pretty significant uh, you know another one of the challenges that I've learned about is we have 21 nursing homes that have closed across the state uh, they're asking they want 300 million dollars um, in order to sustain you know their formula about 70% of people in nursing homes are um, you know receiving a subsidized care you know through Medicare Medicaid mass health um, so those are some of the big challenges. I, you know, I was blown away. I learned that we spent $2.8 bill, um, $2 billion subsidizing uh, pensions. So we put $2.8 billion into pension funding um, to try to make sure that it's fully funded. It was supposed to be by law by 2040, um, but you know we're on schedule to do 2037. With subsidizing the, state pensions? Yes. Um, and so because they've been underfunded for decades and so if you think about 2.8 billion dollars that's a lot of money we spend five and a half billion approximately on on total education and about a billion dollars on local aid um, with the UGGA funds so it is it is a very complicated question um, without question the chapter 70 formula needs to change I think the best thing that has happened and I've been kind of open about this and I, I don't know how positive it is to say in Boston but I promise you it's going to be good for us is the best thing that happened with education in our state is that um, Senator Diaz uh, Sonia Cheng Diaz is not the education chair and Senator Lewis is and the reason for that is this is not so much a partisan issue Democrat versus Republican this is a urban suburban rural politics you know this is breakdown upon what is going on in your region and so for our region, 
the idea of, of rural funding and taking different factors that are not currently in the formula into account is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And so, and declining enrollment, like the biggest problem is, superintendent has mentioned, we have a formula that is based on enrollment. And you've seen, not just in Douglas, but in pretty much every single town in my district, um, with one or two exceptions, and, and they happen to be ELL students, mm -hmm. which then create another problem, mm -hmm. um, you know, for increasing population, is that, um, you know, the Promise Act, which I am a co-sponsor of because I think there's a, the premise of certain things are good. The Promise Act is disproportionately beneficial to urban areas. And that, in my opinion, is a shame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there, uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head how much money you guys spend per pupil, but I would imagine somewhere between 14 and 16,000. No, oh, nah. <laughs> nope. we are. Can we, where do we, oh, where we, do we, we sign up, up for that? that. <laughs> we're we're okay. 37th lowest in, in the state right now, as yep. of the last year, and that is a huge increase from where we've been recently. Huge. We're, so where are we? Only, we used to be the lowest, yeah. the second lowest for years. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I think, lowest. actually, we, we, still, uh, we may have just broke 14,000, actually, to get to, yeah, that, that is at 37. Yeah, just, we're, we're oh, just right that number. He's adding it. For FY18? Is it? Yeah. You know what? I've got it right here. Okay. <laughs> For some reason, I remembered 14, and that, that's what but I. We, yeah. and, and as you know, yeah. in previous yeah. years. I had a 13 Yeah, we, okay. we, yeah. Okay. we, we were in the lowest. Or, right, and so I can tell you that after going through eight of these hearings across the Commonwealth, that people, there are people who believe that spending $25,000 in the city of Boston yeah. per pupil is way too less, is not enough money, not even close to where they need to be, right. and that number should double. Right. And I'm like, Man, people in my district would be like jumping for joy at right. twenty five thousand. Yeah. So it's just it is a dichotomy that's very different. Sonia Chang Diaz is representing Dorchester, Jamaica Plain and in the Boston area, so she's trying to represent her area. Uh, the good news is Jason Lewis, the new chair, is more aligned with um, this thinking of you know, you got to take care of suburban and rural communities as well because he represents a lot of them. So what's what's that going to mean for the for the Promise Act? It sounds like, you know, there might be some rethinking on how to approach this where it feels like the Promise Act is so geared towards this, the inner city. Is that is just going to yeah. blow it up and nothing's going to happen this year? No, I think by June you're going to have a proposal, and I think before July, Chapter 70 Founda Foundation Review Commission implementation will happen. Um, you know, and I think the beginning of the funding is going to start. The governor put 300 million, 302 million dollars in one-time revenues. That is an adjustment in the sales tax factor. So it basically is expediting collection of sales tax a bit earlier than it usually would be, and it equates to about 302 million dollars. And that is what he is proposing to use to, to as a down payment on the first phase, which would be the first year and a half. As we know, that still leaves it at least, depending on how you calculate it, $700 million short. And if you're above that, it's you know, uh, you know, a billion and a half short. Yeah. Right? So, so, so the other, so. the other, I think, you know, it's it's so hard to kind of get a, a gauge on, on some of these bills. The, the troubling thing I heard lately was, uh, we've heard that the one the one billion dollar you know um, number associated with FBRC yep. recommendations. Um, I thought I read somewhere where I think it's the governor's expectations that this, the state would fill 500 million of that and expect local municipalities to fill the other 500 million, mm -hmm. which sounds to me like our, our, our local contribution is going way up. And I have no idea how Douglas would afford any more of a local contribution than what they do now. Yeah. Do you, can you speak to that at all? Yeah. I, well, first of all, I think you know the governor's just one person in this situation. Okay. He's a big person in it, but he's not going to get everything he wants. I promise you that. Um, and one of the things he's been talking about, I think one of, the, one of the concerns that they have is they felt like 1993, they needed to create some sort of standards. And they would argue that their standards that they helped create made us the number one state for math, science, and it, um, you know, uh, language arts in, in the nation. Mm -hmm. And now what they're concerned about is schools like that one of them, which I have in my district, which is Southbridge, and creating accountability and making sure in, in places where that, you know, for example, the, this would inject, the, the um, Promise Act would inject $5 million into Southbridge. Um, $5 million, that's a lot of money. 
and you know Douglas is not nearly that, right? No. But if you're giving someone five million dollars after ten years of giving them a quarter of a billion and not seeing things turn around, mm -hmm. they kind of want to say we should have more control in that conversation, and so that's sort of the trade-off. I think that. Um, with Jason Lewis and then a proposal by Adam Hines, which I'm a co-sponsor of and which I have a lot of hope for, and I talked about that rural component, you know, like land and, you know, proximity of how many students per square mile need to be a conversation, like part of this yeah. conversation. And up to this point, it hasn't. Adam Hines injected it about three weeks ago. And I called him and I talked to him in depth about it. And I said, you know, it, so basically what he's proposing is he wants to, in these rural districts, put $400 per pupil in to help the declining population. I said, that's a fantastic idea, but the amount of districts in the state that actually have that problem, you're not going to be able to build the political support to do that. But hey, why don't you put it on a tiered level and say, you know, if you're 40, if you're 60, if you're 20 per square mile, you know, and, and that starts getting Douglas a lot closer to the conversation. Instead of it being 400, maybe you start at 250, the next tier is down to 200, the next tier is down to 150. And we're talking about really a significant reform that could happen. In talking with the chairman of Ways and Means today, he's very open to that, which is fantastic. The second thing is um, on Friday, I think you guys, um, the superintendent's uh, consortium is having a meeting. Right. One of the things that's gonna happen there is that um, I had has seen um, Dr. Del Falco at the uh, Blackstone Valley Education Foundation yes, the other right. night. Right. And I said, hey, I actually had a conversation with Jason Lewis, the chair, and I invited him to come out because I know that the superintendents have been collaborating for the last several years. And um, I'd like, you know, he said, oh, I'd like to meet with me. And I said, no, you don't want to meet with just me. To have the superintendents in my districts there so that they can tell you about their challenges and you can see this. And he agreed to come. Okay. So on Friday, I think it's we're going to get like five meeting uh, dates pr yeah. proposed okay. that I can present to him and he will come out. He's made that um, commitment, Great. which is fantastic. Yep. And um, I, you know, having school committee members there is welcome too. I, I have no problem with that. Um, I don't want to overload him, uh, but I found him to be very sincere about how he's approaching this. And it's refreshing uh, because it's not just about urban areas. As much as you know, there's been an achievement gap, and I understand that. But kids in Boston are important, and kids in Douglas are just as important, and they shouldn't right. be ignored. Right. You know, as well as Millville and Sutton yeah. and all the other. So I, I think that you know helps address one of my biggest fears, because you know I, I have looked at the, the momentum that the Promise Act has gotten. My huge fear was that this is going to pass. It's not going to help Douglas at all, and everyone's going to say, "Job done, to everybody," right. and that's it. Yeah. And, and we're still left here. Yep. So it's it's good to know that the conversation's pivoting a little bit. That that also it scares me a little bit that that pivot in the conversation means just a further delay. So um, ho ho hopefully that that doesn't end up being the case. Yeah, and I will say that I've been a part of a number of meetings with the governor and the Republican delegation in the House, and that has been a universal concern of. Let's not just overweight all of this support and, and reform into 10% of the, the state schools. We have to make sure that we're doing this equitably. And when you look at the recommendations of the um, foundation review, it was in four areas, healthcare, special ed, ELL, and income levels. And so healthcare and special ed will obviously help everyone. ELL and, and income levels, that's where the money gets disproportionately shared. So we have made that concern very, very known, and certainly we'll look to see whatever version of ed reform comes out, because there is a version in the House, the, uh, the governor's version in the Senate. So we want to make sure that it is something that's not just to those lower income populations. Before you guys move on to anything else, you, you, you touched on pilot earlier, and it's just, you know, I, I know you guys understand the, you know, the struggles with, with the payments and, and the lack of growth in the payments there. Um, and some of the expenses that the state force drives with us, I think particularly in, in the safety area with our fire and police, what we're finding right now in, in doing this exercise in order to try to save some money in our bus routes is just what a burden that state force is on, on, on our busing expenses. We're going through an exercise trying to figure out how to reduce bus routes. You know, we've got a lot of frustration, I think particularly from our, our board of selectmen and, and administrator, they, they see buses roll through town in the morning 
with 20 kids on them and they'll you know, look at our, our bus expenses and say, this is ridiculous, why aren't these buses more full? The problem is our buses have to drive around and through a state forest in order to pick up kids on the other side. <laughs> one of our school committee members is one of those people that lives literally 10 miles away from anybody else and our buses have to deal with that. And that, that, that's, right. it's pro that, that state forest probably costs us $120,000 in busing expenses. Yeah. Um, that I don't think it's probably ever been accounted for in these discussions on pilot, you know, and that pilot payments at roughly two hundred thousand dollars, you know, isn't covering that and the you know the burden on police and fire that it causes as well. It's it's a break even game at best, yeah. um, you know, with, with with those pilot payments. Yeah, and as Ryan mentioned, it, the problem is two tiered. One is in the formula itself, which our conversations with DOR have led us to the belief that they don't have the ability to. Um, take administrative changes. It's a legislatively mandated formula, so that requires us to make a fix, which we have filed legislation to have an in-depth review. Um, there's a number of co-sponsors on that. And the other piece is that it's been level funded for the past 10 to 15 years, yet the state has continued to purchase land throughout the Commonwealth. So when your pot of money stays the same, but the amount of land that that pot's getting divvied up to grows, the amount per parcel goes down, so the funding goes down. So. You know, we are very, very acutely aware of the problem that Pilot at, it presents to the town and have taken a number of steps. Change is slow, unfortunately. But and we so actually got that commission that Joe was talking about actually passed through the budget, and it got at the very last step of that budget, it got removed, which was really mm -hmm. disappointing. Um, and so the hope is we can try to do that again. Another two things that I'm interested in, and it's based on region. Again, you know, that, that – I've, I have found in the course of doing this that region matters more than most anything. And um, so Roderick's being where he's from, and with pilot payments being so such a big deal for his district, um, I said to him, so let me ask you, do you have a queuing up of cars, you know, that are, that's happening um, on your properties from out of state? And he's like, oh yeah, you know, that definitely happens. I said, does it drive you insane that we charge people who live in this state the same amount of money that come from out of the state and use the properties and yet the people who are using those properties but funding them are residents of the state and he's like absolutely and i said so you wouldn't be necessarily opposed if i decided to try to increase these out-of-state fees for residents and he said i would likely support you in that that's a huge statement now it does take several jumps to get through like it has to survive not just the senate and the house but the governor has to be on board with that in the Patrick administration, one of the reasons why they didn't like it was because they were saying it's an access issue. And I said, to me, it's the access for our residents, not Rhode Island and Connecticut. Um, so my hope is we might be able to do something there. I know one of the first things we worked on together a very while ago was to create that local retainer that goes into a trust fund for the town. Um, my hope is we can build upon that. You know, We wanted to put more money for every resident or person that comes through every patron to Douglas State Forest, a certain amount goes into a trust fund, and I think it adds up to about $30,000 a year. Um, and so I wanna see that increase. You know, we, we, we actually, one of the sacrifices we made and what we wanted when we created that was how much money would go in, because they were like, that's too much. And um, we wanted it to be significant. But our first priority was let's get it created so it exists, you know? And now I think it's the time to try to put more money into that by, First, asking out-of-state residents to pay more money, um, which happens in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, and um, am I missing one? I th those four. So, so on that, and I'll open this by saying I am fully, fully, fully in favor of increasing out-of-state, but just to present the other side so that you have an idea of what the argument is, while we see the disincentive for out-of-state visitors as a good thing, as our local residents being able to use the park again, there's an entire region of the Cape and the Islands where they depend exclusively on tourism dollars for their economy, and that could be crippling for them. And so the state is looking at that very critically right. and, and making sure that what we do in Douglas doesn't hurt the Cape and Islands in, in a huge, huge way. So just to be aware that of that situation. Yeah. And I, I do want to mention one quick thing with the um, superintendent's consortium. We've received the letter requesting a hundred thousand right. dollar earmark, and I've already reached out to the ent entire Blackstone Valley delegation, 
we're very much in favor of that amendment and, and looking to push that. And I see no reason why, with the six or seven of us all advocating for additional grant funding in the budget, we won't be able to get that. If not at the full 100,000 request, we should be able to do something there. So I'm right. very optimistic about that. Right. We'll be pushing uh, that yeah. very hard. In, in right. addition to that, one of the things that's really helpful for us when we come to these types of meetings is I saw the $40,000 Chromebooks and the $7,132 textbook line yep. items that are cut. I think we can help with that and perhaps get them back in the budget, um, you know, and, and make that a reality if you think that that is a priority for you. Um, yeah, without if, question. If there's something else that you'd rather spend that kind of money on and, and you want to direct us there, let us know now. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's something that is obtainable. Yeah, and having a, a real item that we can point to right. makes it an easier request than just asking the chairman for ten thousand right. dollars. Yeah, right. and I, for I've, general fund. Yeah. I've tried to make it a habit to actually fund capital items. You know, when I'm requested, um, you know, several years back we didn't do that, but we we knew that there was a problem in Douglas, so we put I think it was two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars from the state budget so. as sort of like a one-time programmatic type money. But since then, we've also done a hundred thousand dollars for an ambulance. And you know, uh, one of the selectmen had approached us about that, and you know, that's a tangible item that frees up money that the town would be spending to purchase it. Now they can spend on something else, you know, the opportunity cost. And so, um, <laughs> looks like there's an idea. <laughs> I'd like to add something. I know that the governor loves to fund education uh, for vocational and technical training mm -hmm. jobs and career readiness. In yeah. Both nationally and globally. Um, if you're talking about a measly forty thousand dollars for Chromebooks, that's everything for us as we try to maintain competitiveness in the Commonwealth with the technology we need to help prepare our kids as twenty first century learners and more importantly, workers mm -hmm. and people to contribute to the economy of the Commonwealth and our country. So we're the, the, what we have now, we're, we're duct tape and bailing wire, but we do great stuff with it. We need to continue to have influx of new capital into these schools so that they can be competitive uh, in the market. And that, um, again, the funding of being as simple as the uh, $40,000 COBOL is everything for these kids to remain competitive. And, and I think we could come up with, you know, beyond the items you saw on the, thre on the, the screen there, there's some other, I, I know we've, we've had some, some STEM projects and robotic projects where there's been some materials that we needed to buy. It's like, okay, I, I, you know, it should last us a year, maybe two years out of these. You know, I think there's some things there where you, you get these kits that are part of a STEM program, but, they, you know, they're, you're, basically you're, you're, you're building stuff and breaking it. You know, that's part of the STEM learning process. So those, those things aren't available to you over and over again. So I think stuff like that. We, we could always use funding around things like that, that, that helps us to replenish some of those things. Um, well, we're not using these for word processing. We're using yeah. these for coding. We're using these yeah. for engineering. Products. Yeah. We're using these for, for robotics. Science, for biology. Yeah. Yeah. For physics. You know, we're, we're getting a lot out of the platform. Uh, but if we're working on uh, iPads that are six, seven years old and shatter the second you touch them, they were, they're phenomenal. They're great. But they are also technology. Anybody here have a cell phone phone six, seven years ago? Mm -hmm. All right, quite so wish I did. So With one, got, um, sorry, go ahead. I, one, one of the things that I, I've been acquainted to is American Student Assistance, which used to be a um, like a student loan provider, and uh, their mission changed, and they've adapted since federal funds have been more skimping on that. And um, so one, they had funded a robotics program in Hopedale, and I got to know them, and I believe they're going to be funding some opportunities for the town of Douglas pretty soon. Right. Um, which is uh, exciting. They're gonna. I, they haven't mentioned that. No. They, they told us today, so they Good. don't want it to be too public. But there's, uh, I believe, six hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars worth of grants that they're providing. I believe they're doling out that money to even communities. And um, Douglas is one of those eleven communities. So, so that can, is we good news. can we share the news? I was told not to, but it sounds like it's cats out of the bag. Cats out of the bag. Oops. <laughs> well, so here, herein lies. The, the irony of that, 
Um, there is rumor that Douglas may, in fact, be in the pipeline for a sizable award, a grant that, that at the middle school that Brian has um, championed. The downside is, if you looked at that presentation, the teacher for that position that isn't there. Yeah. Isn't there. I think one of the things that kind of answer your point is that this group has noted has found a niche and they've said okay we can provide a service to districts where you know they're having issues with students leaving um, going to the vocational schools and they want to step in and say hey we can provide funding to make the districts more competitive and I think they're going to continue to do those types of things obviously but, that challenge is a big but, one but. so in, in, in that same vein is the is the conversations around the Blackstone Valley Superintendents Consortium has been that the, the letter that you received is for the initial program that we want to try to offer to the 13 districts and everybody to take advantage of the distance learning opportunities, going to the, edu the education hub and, and getting involved with the manufacturing piece that Mr. Delaney is talking about. But we're also looking down the road to try and appoint someone who will basically run the, the Blackstone Valley Consortium as a curriculum director, someone who maybe has years of experience in the area of curriculum development and administration, because the, the long term of it is that none of the superintendents have the ability to take on additional tasks such as that. But someone skilled, knowledgeable, and task-oriented can help us in doing this and bring the opportunity for us to bring distance learning into the, the valley where it will allow our students to take advantage of courses that they, they couldn't get. Or for somebody from Hopedale to take microeconomics for us, or for one of our, our students to take a course in Hopedale, um, and, and so forth. That's the next iteration, is that we need someone who works directly for the, for the, um, the schools under the superintendent's leadership, but they run this program. They're watching the courses, the, 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 the quality of the courses. They're, they're reviewing the quality of the course, the assessments and so forth. And they're championing it for us as opposed to, you know, one of us trying to take it on. We just, it just can't, it's just not going to happen. We're trying to manage it by committee, which Correct. Would be which is, which is, of, which yeah. is really difficult. Uh, Josh sits on the, uh, Josh Romano, our high school principal, sits on the subcommittee, which is part of this initial course and has been championing it. The people in Uxbridge are doing, Mike Rubin and, and Uxbridge High School are doing some great things over there, and we're trying to t tie in with them as well as with Hopedale because they're, they're good friends of ours as well. This is a, a burgeoning area. It really is. But the hard part is, A, sustainability with regards to funding. I mean, I want very much to be part of it, but not at the cost of taking $50,000 away from a classroom teacher. Right. So therein lies the, 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 the conundrum for us. We want to be part of it, but you can't knowingly become part of something and contribute to something knowing that it's taking away from something internally in your district. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, I, I've been in this business for a long time. This is, this is one of the, the this is a, a viable uh, bubbling up of academic programs and, and, and coursework and, and programs and hands-on internships that's going to be, could be revolutionary for this area. Yeah. Interestingly, being the hub of the Industrial Revolution and so forth, it makes sense. However, um, all of us are, are confronted with the same conundrum, which is seed money and, and, and continuous support monies for it. So anything that we would appreciate, anything that's going to happen with us, with, with, for us with regards to that, this initial program, but down the road, we would need to some, see some sustainability. We, you mentioned that one time. If that yeah, position are, could are be picked up, that'd be great. Multi-year grants or, or earmarks or you know whatnot with that is is that possible or is it typically only a one year? I know the year? American Student Assistance is going there. Yeah. Like, and this is a program that I actually shared with them. 
I told them about how the superintendents were all speaking, and it just it was happenstance um, that it was Dr. DeFalco because I had sat down with him um, the week before, and then I said, "Oh, you need to talk to Dr. DeFalco," and I think he was on. We did a conference call with American Student Assistance. I also know that there was a program that the um, Baker Plato administration had created uh, called the Commonwealth. Um, what was that called? The Compact where they had all the signing. The community compact. Community compact. And they, it was, you know, relatively small money statewide, but they said, okay, well, this has worked so well for municipalities. Why don't we do this for school districts as well? Copy best practices and then put funding behind it. So now the governor's budget, I think it was $20 million set aside for like this innovation, uh, innovation grants. So for districts that are doing innovative uh, opportunities in education they're providing grant funding and it is multi-year uh, to the superintendent's point about Oxbridge they're big on the robotics um, and the lieutenant governor was out there in uh, I think it was late January mm -hmm. uh, touring their program because she was looking at that as an opportunity for this money um, that they're trying to advocate for within the budget process that has to survive the entire process. I think there's a good chance because um, it, it's an innovative way of trying to make, um, you know, lemonade out of lemons, right? right. Well, so and we we implemented a robotics program here at the high school just 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 this year, first first attempt at it, which has gone well, and we would look to expand it, but also expand into the the coding area, and we do coding all the way down to the preschool. I mean, so um, these are things that we want to do. Um, funding is, is, is the piece because it's new, it's different, it's, there are some materials that need to be purchased, there's some staffing that needs to take place, and um, you know, one of the things that I, I'll mention that I'll be quiet, I know Brett, you have some things to talk about, is that we were on the, uh, we, we made a, some inroads in trying to get involved with a program called Education Alliance, which is uh, in, in the city, and we're looking to expand and one of the things that we think is a real niche for us out here is animal and plant science, which you saw in my presentation, is to begin offering animal and plant science courses here. Why drive all the way to Walpole when you can you could do it right here? And we see that as a, a viable opportunity, and it was the next phase for us, but this is what we talked about, the momentum piece, not being able to implement it, somebody else jumps 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 on top of it and we don't we don't benefit from it. So um, anything that can be done to support a new program, and we're talking about, um, you know, greenhouse and community gardens, and we're talking about hands-on work for students at, with, with small animals, large animals, and, and so forth, the whole spectrum of it, which is a, certainly a growing industry. Um, you know, um, the, the, the lettuce that you get for your, for your salad is coming out of, a, uh, out of a warehouse. It's not coming from the great Midwest anymore. You know, and it's sustainable farming that's done, and we want to be part of that. And that's that was one of the things that Doc was very, very okay. big on, as a as a as a huge and up and coming industry is a sustainable gardening, gardening and in in crop uh, idea. And we would want to get part of it, and and that's what I'm afraid of losing that momentum of being the ones to jump on board of that. Um, so. Um, Senator Thalm, you, you mentioned that you were signed under the sponsor of a Promise Act. Mr. McKenna, are you also signed on with that? I, 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 was, I was not signed on to the Promise Act, and okay. I, I'm not sure that I signed on to Paul Tucker's bill in the House. Yeah, but could I, you speak about that? Because that was my next question. Is that, is that a competing bill? How, how does the Tucker bill, you know? It, I guess you could look at it as a competing bill, but it's, it's a way to present additional ideas. And all three of these bills kind of get put into a blender. and. and ultimately make up what will be education reform. It doesn't need to be one versus the other. Okay. And so um, I, I think that's his way of saying in the House that, yes, we support education reform and increased Chapter 70 commitments. And these are some ideas that we have for it. But I, I think even he would say, I'm not going to stand here and, you know, advocate for one over the other. Maybe there's some pieces of the Promise Act, some pieces of the Governor's Bill, and some pieces of Rep Tucker's Bill that need to ultimately uh, be put forward. So we did have the, the hearing on these three bills was on March 22nd, so not being on Ways and Means or on Education, I, I haven't had a, a kind of a 
okay. um, decompression of though that hearing to see where things stand right now. But I know that I, I co-authored a letter with the senator to you guys to say, look, where we understand the need completely yeah. for education reform, we will support that. You know, what form do you think that that needs to take place to yeah. best serve Douglas? Okay. I have one other bill that I, that I just heard about in, in the last week or so. Um, I think it's H-476, special education funding. And I believe what that's doing is, is lowering the threshold the on the circuit yeah. breaker from four times foundation budget to three times, right. as right. well as increasing the circuit breaker reimbursement to 85 percent? Uh, I can't remember. It was, it was going to graduate up to a certain number. I, can't, I don't know how high it went. So I, there's multiple bills that okay. are proposed that do that. I think both of us are co-sponsors on Dave Meridian, the state rep from Grafton, because okay. uh, he has the same proposal. I'm not sure if that's the exact number. Okay. There's probably seven or eight of them out there. Yeah. Um, I believe. And I might even grab the wrong bill because you, you go through the, your, your website, which is a plethora of information, but to try to read and figure out what what is actually in some of these bills. If you if you you're, you're saying not used you to haven't read all five thousand bills in the Massachusetts <laughs> legislature. Yeah. I tried this week. I got through about <laughs> four of them. Yeah, but so, that is a good one. And yeah, that that one to me goes support. directly to so yeah again some of the you know the the issues that we've seen with special education funding, particularly for you know Courtney had the chart up there, the growth in that out of district special education funding, and if you increase that circuit breaker, you know it's just it can be so helpful to us, you know. Um, yeah. You know, especially a small town like us, where you know, went from 10 years ago we had $234,000 in out of district special education expense to $2.5 million within seven years. Um, that's, you know, to have that the entire burden of that expense fall on a town like Douglas over that short period of time, just there's no way for us to adjust to that without, you know, impacting negatively a lot of other things. Um, so to have some of that more expense be picked up by the state rather than fall to a small town like Douglas is, is really and, and you're seeing it across all grade levels from all the way from pre-k all the yeah. way to grade 12 you're seeing yeah. situations that you just had not seen in years gone by mm -hmm. um, and, and it does have an adverse impact but mm -hmm. it, you, you, um, it, the social emotional piece if I could talk to that just for a second is is so incredible what what's going on in every one of our buildings um, and, and, and it's all students, it's, it, it's not just related to particular students, all students are struggling with it. And um, um, anything that can be done to support programs with regards to social, emotional, even if it's professional development, even if it is, it, it's just training opportunities, is a real benefit because it, it's, um, it, it's, it's very prevalent in every one of our buildings. And, and um, we're no different than anybody else. There is a trust fund one-time money type thing. It's a trust fund that they're proposing with one-time monies of above $30 million that is for the social emotional development for more guidance counselors, more trainings, um, you know, uh, opportunities for children to explore different social emotional um, whatever. I don't know, yeah. you know, what, but that, that it does exist in the governor's budget. Um, so where it goes, it is only one-time money. That's but, the problem. So mm, he's proposing $30 million. Another thing that is coming up that I think is going to be proposed soon is a school safety grant funding, uh, like an infrastructure, if you think MSBA. Obviously, with the concern that a lot of communities have with what's happened across the country, school violence, you know, how do you, how do you build an infrastructure and technology that can help mitigate if, God forbid, it ever does happen? So there is discussion about a bond bill that would be available for all communities to upgrade their own facilities on the state's dime and help institute some of those programs. One of them I've seen, I'm going to see it uh, firsthand. I saw a presentation in the state house. It's an infrared system. It's based on a, a, a firing of a weapon, which sends out a signal immediately directly to the police department. The infrared sensors pick up on it and you know, basically the most important thing at that moment is time in response and making sure that people are notified and accurate information is displayed. So this, there's infrared um, sensors that are in place across the school so that it can actually follow where an active shooting would be happening. Um, again, very rare, 
Mm-hmm. Hope it never happens, but this is a discussion that's it's reality. Would, that, reality. Yeah. Sorry, would any of that bond money be re- available for, uh, retroactively? I guess we've done some small things, um, additional video cameras in, in this building, some key carding of doors that all really based around that, you know, the same concept, concept of, of securing, you know, better securing the building and, and whatnot. So. I don't want to say no, but I generally wouldn't be optimistic okay. that they would have a look back because I okay. think that there will be such a demand moving yeah. forward that okay. they'll have that accounted for. Okay. Um, just to your point and the Senators, uh, Dave Moradian's bill is H-535, and it's you. substantially very similar to the other one, which was Pat had at had okay. that one. So both are bipartisan, have broad support, and certainly have our support. Thank you. Um, um, anyone else? Just, have, yeah. yeah, I just have just a few things. Yeah. Um, back to when you mentioned about the rural or the definite, definition of rural, did you state that they will be looking at the definition and how you fall in? It seems that in Douglas, since I've been here, we never seem to have quite the right situation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're not the gateway, we're not poor enough, we're not rich enough, we're not, we're not rural, rural enough. we're just yeah. not, we never, it's been kind of a really, really odd thing. Yeah. So, we, we, um, a lot of cracks. Yeah, that we, is we really do. So would you be, is there, is anyone amenable to actually looking at, and there are various ways, as, as you yeah. know, to do that. Um, it's not like it might just be based on on, on a student's per, per square yeah, I think mile kind of as yeah, a definition. Yeah, just per that or maybe it, something. It is, but I think to Joe's point is like you know the Promise Act, Tucker's bill, Peisch's mm-hmm. bill, like all these proposals. They're essentially there's not going to be one. They're yeah. going to be all yeah. of them, and they're right. going to take ideas. And this is okay. one of the ideas that I think yeah. will end up being in. And mm-hmm. the reason why I reached out to Senator Hines so quickly after he came out with it was I had Douglas and Sutton in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I could say oh, I had Dudley in mind, but that's a little different because they're regional. Right. I could say Menden, same thing. Regional. regional. Right. Blackstone Bill, 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 regional. Thing. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. specifically, I had Douglas yeah. and Sutton in mind, and um, thought this might be an opportunity um, mm-hmm. for us to gain ground. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do know that I was at a presentation. This is based on practice, which is in place in Wisconsin. Their mm-hmm. their state law has a rural factor, oh. as, as the senator mentioned that offers the 400 reimbursement per pupil automatically per square mile or however it's factored. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is based on a a policy in place in in Wisconsin. And Senator Hines' district is far more rural than ours, so that that is a concern of, well, is it, are we rural enough, Mm -hmm. like you mentioned, but I think that we can certainly find something that works. So I just had a couple more things. You mentioned, and I'm very pleased to hear about the foundation adjustment possibilities of the foundation adjustment to circuit breaker and also going to 85%. The only concern that I have is that whether or not the funding would be available to actually, because um, everything's subject to appropriation. Because we've had, we've been, the legislature has been hard press, and I know it's difficult, you have competing interests and all, um, you know, throughout finite money, like we all have. Um, but I believe it's only once in, on my spreadsheet, I think I went back eight years that it's been at 75%, that what they were even able to fund at 75%. So yeah. what that we would get be, to like what I'm saying is it would require a large no, increase in additional appropriation yeah. to do the additional 10%, plus you're increasing the eligibility for that 85% as well. Yeah. So it would require funding. And um, at least the, the bill that I read, the, mm-hmm. the, it, it took, I think, five years to get to 85%. It, okay. I think it went to like 77 and a half. So right, you know, but still, years. still that subject to appropriation yeah. part of it. But, and um, um, just one other thing, uh, actually two other things, um, and I know we're way past building our schools, but I know something that we've kind of thought of since we built our brand new school. Have you heard anything about MSBA looking at their, their so-called model schools with the new world that we live in with regard to um, student safety as far as you know the, the material that they're made with or maybe coming up with something more standardized that, that that's takes part those of that public safety um, mm-hmm. uh, bond bill so okay. that, that is um, so basically you know they float the bond it'll be borrowing against um, the state's credit mm-hmm. um, but it is directly based on that the Patrick administration okay. put out a a whole thing about school safety with regards to MSBA right. and how they're in the buildings, their schools. Like, the schools, and, right. Um, so this would be supplemental to help with that mission. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. And we have one, one more question. Um, to Brett's point, I went to look um, <clears throat> on the, um, there were, I forget how many proposals requiring seat belts for school buses. Can you give us an update where that stands? 
It will never happen. Okay. Thank you. Well, there you go. That didn't take too long. As, as long as, I, I kind of didn't think it would, but I, know, you know. I, I had sat down with probably 35 bus vendors in our area yeah. over at the public house in Sturbridge, and um, they're well organized. They're adamantly opposed, and um, I don't think that will ever happen. Okay. I, I was only concerned because obviously that would add to the cost substantially as yeah. well. That's why I wanted to know. And I saw about four bills I thought running through, and it, it looked like they were moving forward, and then they just all kind of stopped. I feel, yeah. I feel so now I study. I just said it will never happen so yep. definitively, and I've, I've said that a few times in the last three and a half years, two and a half years. So okay. I'm maybe I shouldn't have said that so quickly because it's just like crazy things happen <laughs> well, all the time. I wrote it down. I got the quote. Good, but thank you very much for your time. Any, any other Appreciate questions? I, I do have one more, uh, I think, big question. It's kind of the overarching question. Quite reminding me of it with, with the idea of subject to appropriation. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we, we, we had the, the, the housing, you know, bubble and crisis back in 2007, 2008, created the recession. You know, I could understand where state aid and, um, you know, spending from the state, you know, was cut back there. We're, we're a decade removed from that now, the economy, is as good as it's ever been. Um, unemployment at record lows, GDP growing at you know great rates. I can't. If if we can't find a way to fund these things now in this economy, when um, it, it seems like you know it, we're we're still not seeing any of the results of what should be a good economy and good results for local towns um, and for the state as a whole. If, if it doesn't happen now, you know they're saying another recession is a year away. What happens then? Uh -huh. so, uh, <laughs> Mass health is a major problem. Mm -hmm. The governor has put forward really good proposals. The legislature hasn't adopted them. Um, you know, there's about 250,000 people who are on Mass Health in a subsidized way that could actually afford um, to go to the health connector, which is still subsidized, but yeah. a little less so. And it takes the burden off the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. That would free up um, several million dollars and I want to go as far as to say it's over a hundred million dollars I believe the, num I, the numbers that staggered me this is a couple years old now is when we adopted I believe it was 2014 when the state voted to adopt the Obamacare regulations it was something like four or five hundred thousand people who had insurance offered through a private employer who said no thank you and mm -hmm. switched over and became part of the mass health world yeah, and that was something like two to three billion dollars worth of coverage for people again had private insurance through an employer offered but the state was offering a better plan so they went on to the state plan I mean those are just staggering numbers there's also an interesting thing that's happening with our economy like it and this is getting discussed a lot more we always had a um, you know, like a product-based economy, a consumer-based economy, and now we've gone to a service-based, you know, it's really service-based, mm -hmm. and we don't tax things the same way. And so, it just was in the front page of Boston Globe about how the Senate President was wanting to put together a commission to talk about how we actually look at taxation and have a overhaul of it, potentially. Um, and it, you know, it's interesting, I've been appointed to that commission, um, and so, I'm really interested, and in the guy who's chairing it is Adam Hines, the person who has the rural school. And he said, you know, I want to make sure you know it's this is not just about raising taxes. We really want to look at things. And I said, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I understand. Like, it, it, despite the fact that we have three percent unemployment today, um, you know, the revenue numbers that came in, and, and the and the highest workforce, labor workforce in the history of the Commonwealth, three point seven million people working. Um, you know, we had a we had some money problems that came in, revenue problems that came in, and it was kind of shocking. And I think it the, the thought process is it's, it, there needs to be a modernization about how you tax, um, you know, services versus products and consumer. Um, and so that's I think starting to really take place. That conversation is going to kick off real soon. Okay. And my last point will be whatever reform ends up taking place, the governor's. Um, price tag of his reforms was $1.1 billion, but that's over a seven-year phase-in. Yeah. I think the Senate was a seven-year phase-in as well. Yeah. There was no phase-in time frame on the House, but it's not going to be $1.1 dropped out of a, an airplane on year one. It's going to be over a, a seven- or eight-year phase-in, so just to keep in the back of the mind. Thank you. Um, good? 
if there's nothing else, is you know, these, these are things that you've probably heard before, but I, I can't let you go without repeating them again because I, I can't repeat them enough. Um, and I, you know, tonight's discussion helped me feel better that you actually understand. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the last part of this off because it was a little a little nastier. But <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, um, but um, you know, in 2009, state aid to Douglas accounted for 40 sorry 47 percent of our funds available for appropriation. Um, and local, you know, property taxes and local receipts were 53. In 2019, state aid is down to 38.5% of our available funds for appropriation. So 47 down to 38.5 in those 10 years. And the local part portion is up to 61.5. 0.53%, that's the annual growth rate of the gross state aid to Douglas, less the school choice. I'm not giving you guys you know, credit for the school choice in positive numbers that we've had. That's, that's on us. Um, between 2009 and 2019. 2.47%, that's the annual growth rate of the total state aid going back to all towns. So we're seeing a case where, you know, I always assumed it was just, oh, state aid in general is down to 0.53. No, that's not the case. You know, we're just getting point. Part of that's the decreasing enrollment numbers. Yeah, I was, you know, I so was gonna I, say, I, will, you know, I appreciate. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah so I, I do understand up, some of that there. Um, and I kind of made that connection during, during, you know, during tonight. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think Douglas should have been doing better than 0.53% during, during that time. Um, so it just feels like, you know, D Douglas is subsidizing, uh, you know, a whole lot of other folks um, with, with our state income tax dollars. Um, if state aid had grown at just 1% per year, we'd have an extra $450,000 in state aid in FY19. At 1.5% per year, that's a million dollars in FY19 for us. And if it had been at the 2.47% that the, the entire state saw, that'd be $2 million in state aid for us in FY19. Um, one more big number, 11%. That's the percent increase in property taxes that Douglas residents voted for last year with the override. To see a total increase of about 15% when you take in the, you know, the normal 2.5% and the 2.5% on top of that. Um, so, you know, again, D Douglas stepped up big time last year to help ourselves. Um, that, that, that's not happening again mm, anytime yeah. <laughs> in my lifetime, probably. Um, yeah. Any other help? It's got to come from you guys at this point. We, we've done our part, so um, I'll leave the rest of it. I think I, I, <laughs> before you leave, um, I just want to say, you know, I've been in this chair for the last three years, and before that, very active in the community, and we've had many conversations. And um, I appreciate everything that you guys brought to the table today, and. Um, I just want to. I just want to ask you, um, what's different four years ago or five years ago than today? Like, how do you do? You feel hopeful that we're we're heading in the right direction in order to change this, so that we're not dealing with this year after year. Well, we have new chairman of education in the Senate, which is a big thing. As Ryan mentioned, we've got two new chairs of budget writing committees, which we'll see how that goes. Um, in the House, it's Aaron Michaelwitz, who is the North End rep, so he is a city rep, so, and he's very much part of the inside group uh, up on Beacon Hill, so we'll, we'll see, I believe next week, what the House budget looks like. Um, I'm not sure. I, I can't give you a definitive answer on that. I, Unfortunately, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, and, and, and that's fine. I, I think my other question would be, um, I know that, you know, a few years back, you know, we inundated both you guys and other people at the State House with letters and, you know, if positions have changed, do we need to have those contacts and have those letters emailed again? And, mm. you know, I think that, you know, you get tired of constantly, you know, how many letters have I sent to either one of you? And nothing changes, but you don't want to give up either. You know what I mean? It, it gets tiring kind of, and, and I feel like, you know, it's kind of like I'm harassing you at the same time because what more can we be doing? And so I feel like, all right, so if positions have changed, if we start, you know, sending letters to them, is that going to be helpful? I feel like as a community, we still need to be educated from you guys to know what else can we be doing as like a grassroots outside of school committee and I think people want to help but they don't know how to and it goes silent again and this isn't going away. Yeah. 
and, and the I kids are paying the ultimate price. Probably to your point too is I think a lot of a lot of people that do did have wanted to help have been helping and probably put a lot of their efforts into the override battles over the last you know six years and. Um, a lot of folks that were fighting those battles are, are just tired. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, how, how do we get new voices um, mm -hmm. brought into the conversation? Because a lot of the old ones, I think, just don't have the, the wherewithal at this point to, to continue fighting. Yeah, and I, I guess my optimism, kind of word of optimism, would be that it's not just the legislature pushing it right now, it's the governor and the secretary of education as well. So this conversation is really in a good way taking all the air out of the the room on beacon hill it's driving the agenda in the early part of the year and that's a good thing so it's it's not just one segment or one group that's pushing their bill it's it's a very very broad conversation yeah yeah i also think that it, i think this will be done this year um but you know making sure that the funding is sustained throughout the seven right. years yeah. is really important. Yeah, and making sure it's a good resolution, not just, just more not money a resolution, yeah, right? in, in a small group of schools. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if you guys, either one of you had seen that. Um, I didn't get the whole thing, just a glimpse of that Betsy, is it Davos, or how do you say her yeah. last name? The, the comment of um, high class sizes are great for kids and they learn from each other and it was a positive thing. She had nothing to back it up and I thought that that was a very, disheartening thing to hear when we're going through all this stuff and, and thinking that we have somebody that's advocating for high class sizes that's in a position of making change and that's not a good thing <laughs> and it, that. you didn't see that you didn't, didn't know right. that was said tell so. jet back to 2016 yeah. when we had 30 kindergartners in the yeah. class um, yeah. nothing positive comes out of that and I'd hate so. to see that that's something that's being said by somebody that has power to make change. <laughs> yeah. Well, the good news is education is very, very localized throughout our country yeah. and state. And so her ability to impact Massachusetts is very minimal. Oh, it really is. God. Good to know. All right, it is getting late. Yep. Um, we have other business to attend to. We thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for this thank you both very much for coming out. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward thank to you. hearing good news from you on many fronts. And yes. we would be very much interested if, you, if there is money for the Chromebooks, we would certainly be more than happy to take that, that yes. offer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Okay. Uh, we are at almost 9 o'clock and about halfway through our agenda. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we are up to our school committee and subcommittee report, accounts payable report, okay. Ms. Brown. March 14th, 2019, I signed 11 batches, totaling $226,559.81. On March 21st, 2019, I signed 8 batches, totaling $185,425.90. And on 328.19, 9 batches, totaling $106,761.78, and nothing unusual. Okay. Any questions on any of that? Okay. Let's move to our consent agenda. Um, we have three sets of minutes. Um, any questions, comments on the uh, minutes here? did have a chance to read through them. The only issue I saw, but I, I think it's actually ac accurately reflected, was during the our joint meeting with Finance Committee. It reflects here that I, I refer to, you know, approximately a $15 million budget and, you know, uh, approximately $2 million. And I, I, know, I know Courtney hates referring to approximate numbers like that, but that's actually how I stated it. So I, I think the minute um, writer got, got, got that right. Um, so I am unless anyone has the actual numbers that I should have spoken that they want to put in there, I, I, I think it's okay. I can get over it. Okay, thank I can, you. I can, I can sleep tonight. Um, <laughs> so other than that, I, I didn't see anything else of note myself. The first two all I will not Okay. So I will ex looking for a motion to um, accept these minutes. Um, let's, I guess let's do them each separately, starting with our oldest, which is March 6th. 
um, and Ms. Canero is um, staining as uh, she was not in attendance. So I'll make a motion to accept the school committee meeting minutes of March 20th, 2019. Okay, I'm March 20th, okay. Oh, sorry. I was, I was going to go back to March. That's, that's fine. Uh, March 20th. <laughs> I have so we have a motion from, <laughs> from Kelly. Second. I have a second from Lisa. And actually, you were the Jillian. So yeah, was that on one I was good. All right. I could have done. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any other discussion on March 20? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Okay. Which one do we want to tackle next? I'm Go backwards. Out of it now. All right. You guys can practice here. So we have, because I can't yeah, do exactly. either one of these. So we have uh, March 12th here, which. I'll make a motion to accept the meeting minutes from March 12th, 2019. We have a motion from Lisa second. and a second from Kelly. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain? Is that the one you're abstaining yes, from? Yeah. Okay, one abstain from Ms. Yes. Canero, a nays, seeing none. Approved. All right, March 6th. I make a motion to accept the meeting minutes from March 6, 2019. Okay, we have a motion from Lisa and a second from Kelly. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. We have one abstain from Jillian. Okay, that's done. Next, we were supposed to tackle executive session minutes tonight. Um, Miss, um, the, the set of minutes we're going to tackle tonight were um, done under um, Ms. Mulder, uh, Secretary of Ship, um, if that's the right word. But um, seeing how she's not here, um, I think we should um, pass those um, to a future session um, in case we do have any questions on, on the minutes and she's not here to answer them. So um, I'd like to just push those off to a future meeting. Any objections? Okay. Um, we already addressed the DMS eighth grade class trip. So next is our FY 2020 school department budget. And I did provide to you the updated um, detailed budget dated um, for this evening, April 3rd, 2019. And this brought the budget down to the exactly the 2% as indicated earlier. Yeah, so that we, we, we had some discussion on this this week. Just felt like, again, we, the, the best information we have right now is that we're getting a 2% appropriation. Um, we don't have that in final yet. Um, there's still a very slight chance it would be 1%. And God, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, but um, if, if the town administrator's health insurance plans um, fall through somehow, but I think um, this, this is where we're at right now. Um, and, and there is, I don't know, if, if you watch the finance committee meetings, they, there keeps some very vague talk of them submitting their own budget. Um, and I'm not sure if that means they're, they're trying to submit more, you know, get more money on our behalf or not, or if they're trying to get more money for something else. But um, again, uh, I can't, don't think that's something we can count on either. So I think this 2% budget is, is the best one to vote on at this point. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't, I don't know, I will ask, do you, does anyone want to go through any of the details of the budget or do you all have enough information to vote on at this point? We have enough information to vote on Nobody at this point. Nobody has any questions about anything? We'd be happy right. to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. I'm just going to make sure the, the, back, the back page puts to the number I'm expecting and it does, so. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I am ready. Okay, so I'll make a motion to approve the FY 2020 School Department General Fund budget in the amount of $13,589,970, which represents a 2% increase over the, over the approved FY 2019 General Fund budget. The 2% increase is the recommended increase from the town administrator as of this evening. Okay, we have a motion from Jillian. Second. second. I have a second from Lisa. I beat you to it. Any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Seeing none. We are approved. We have an approved budget. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, no, seriously, thank you to everyone. I know this has been painful. We would have thought after an override it would have been as painful this year, and it feels like it may have actually been more painful this year, if that's possible. Um, thank you all for your work uh, put into this. Um, next, school bus transportation route adjustment. Um, so you all have um, a packet in front of you that says school bus logistics on the top as the consultant that we've been using. And I handed out to you, board members, um, uh, some detailed spreadsheets. I'm going to pass these over to Courtney and Kevin. This is the same information that's included in the packet that he provided us. It was just the, the raw spreadsheet that I printed out for myself. It, I, I found it easier to, to work off of than his report. Okay, thank you. Um, so what you will find in the report is his recommendations. Um, the last week we spoke about um, his initial recommendation was, was to reduce three bus routes. Um, we, we felt that was insane, even the, the, this, 
the town administrator who was very much in favor of trying to reduce routes thought trying to reduce three was was not something we'd ever want to try. Um, we asked them to go back and give us two scenarios. Um, what if we reduce one bus route and what if we reduce two bus routes? That is what is contained in this packet. The one thing to note is that under, under the one bus route scenario you see in here, it reduces a particular bus route and, um, and, and those kids, students are redistributed to other bus routes. Um, the, the consultant's goal there was to um, be able to reduce a bus route and have the have impact the least, the fewest number of students. So by moving that one bus route to two additional bus routes, it impacted the fewest number of students, but what happened is it had, it had a larger impact on those students because the ride time on those two bus routes got larger and the number of students um, on the bus um, got quite a bit larger. Whereas in scenario two, where he actually recommends reducing the second bus route, that second bus route was actually less impactful. So my recommendation back to him was, yeah, I, I get what you were doing, but I think it would actually be um, more in our interest to um, take the second bus route out first if we were to reduce only one bus route, um, which spreads that bus route out to four different buses. It's impacting more students, but has a lower impact per, you know, on those students. Um, so that would be my recommendation. I think we can accept a, a proposal tonight to, to reduce either one or two and then decide which of those bus routes we would reduce if it's only one. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so just, I, I think this deserves some more discussion at this point. Um, to me, reducing one bus, um, especially if, if it's that second bus that um, in the proposal, seems pr fairly painless. It, it does increase ride times five to six minutes. Um, you know, number of students on the buses go up a little bit. Nothing too, too terrible in my mind. Um, reducing two bus routes, less painful than what I expected even. But it, I think it does, there are some risk factors out there for us um, under, under the, that reducing that second bus, you, you would have some elementary and primary schools um, with ridership in, in the 50s, um, which can be an issue without bus monitors. Um, we already see some issues um, with behavior um, and trying to manage <laughs> the number of students on bus with ridership numbers quite, quite a bit lower than that. Bringing ridership numbers up to that number just introduces some additional risk for how is a bus driver gonna manage um, that number of kids. Um, and if they, if they are, being unruly and what kind of dangers that presents. Yeah. Um, the other thing is we do have some positive enrollment trends um, going on, um, particularly like the kindergarten. So these are, numbers are all based on current ridership. Um, if we're seeing, you know, if we see an, an initial 30 students in an in district next year, what does that do to this? And if they all end up happen to end up on some of the higher ride time buses as it is, what, what does that do? Um, so a couple of things to consider when, when considering the reduce one bus route versus reduce two versus do nothing. Um, I think we've talked about the, 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 the do nothing. I, I don't think we're in a position where, where we can do nothing. Um, I think we need, we need to do something um, in order to be able to continue investing in, into our programs. Um, and if that means that we can get a STEM teacher from Mr. Delaney so that he can take advantage of grant money that might be available to him, I think that's something that we, we very much need, need to do. Um, so. Questions, comments, concerns? Well, for me, the biggest question that I had in the biggest issue that I have is what was talked about at, at, at Selectman last night is the space and time. Yeah. It, 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 we're talking about, we, this is something that had been just, has been bantered back and forth uh, in previous years. Um, my concern, as you mentioned, I think when I looked at it myself this afternoon, um, I looked at it and, and, and two doesn't seem as painful as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, the question that still remains unanswered, I know that Ms. Keegan has asked it a couple of times, is what happens if you were to vote to eliminate two and you needed to add back one? Where does the, the, the money come for adding back that one, that one bus route? Yeah. It's a separately voted appropriation at town meeting. There's no way without a town meeting to get more money into that account. Yeah, I, I think it would have to be addressed at special town meeting um, at that point, um, if that happens. I'll, I'll confirm, I, you know, I think we have a plan to meet with Mr. Wojcik um, this week to wrap up um, the, just the details on getting, getting our, our, our bid out um, in order to secure a busing contract. I think, you know, we, we need to cover that and just, you know, make sure that's understood that if we were to go with the more aggressive approach with two buses, there needs to be a solid plan in place as to 
what that, you know, if we had to add one. Now, adding one back sounds like a disaster regardless of where the funding is coming from because now you're two weeks into the school year or if, if that's, the, that's the time period and you're right. adjusting exactly. everyone's buses and a student that was on bus five is now on bus seven and he used to be picked up at 735 and now he's picked up at 725 and it, it just, you know. Um, well, so you, I think that's and, another reason to maybe not fight off that big of a change right now. I don't know. And I just want to remind everyone that we have always had the ability through our bid process and our contract to reduce buses. Yeah. In fact, we came close to reducing one this year, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't able to happen in the current con the construct that we have. Um, so to Brett's point, you know, we could do that. Taking one off, in addition one off later on, is much easier to do than trying to add one back after you start off, start off the school year. Yeah, the, the way and I redo because yeah. you would actually have to redo. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the way I, I framed this with the selectman last night was I, I felt confident that we would be able to reduce um, one bus, um, at least one bus, you know, for next year um, route. But that it's it's a it's a topic that we're going to continue to look at, and you know, we would look at potentially reducing the second route bus route for next year if we only went with the single route this year. Um, but just it would give us a chance to kind of adjust to. You know the, the the new dichotomy of, of having that one reduced route. See how it, you know what happens with enrollment trends. See how everyone adjusts to that. And, Neely, question. question. Yeah, so I, I, I don't I know what a bus monitor out. costs, but we, we, we do yeah. know that we do expect that you know reducing a bus route would save us sixty thousand dollars. Reducing two is one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Well, fifty. Netting off the ten thousand dollar cost for getting the routes done. Okay. So you know it's a fifty thousand dollar you know change, okay. but so. But I did bring that up, um, Neely, and you know, and I also did a, a listserv looking at who has monitors, who doesn't. Um, a lot of school districts, as you know, because it has been brought up, because uh, you know we have we have issues currently on on some buses with the number of students that we currently have and the way things are today. So we, there has been discussion on that, and um, you know my biggest risk management, liability, but also the fact that it could lead to forcing us to have monitors, and it, and it will be costly. So yeah. I um, just, I'm just yeah. No, I think that yeah, I think yeah. That, that's a that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. I think that's. Mm -hmm. Back. That, that's definitely not a, a fact that we did not no. include in our analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, th that, that's definitely something that was not um, discussed as a factor in, you know, calculating ride times. So, good point. It is going to be more time. One other issue that I brought up to as well is there's a nationwide shortage of bus drivers. And to that point, um, if they're dealing with 50, dis, you know, not all 50 of them, but a lot of a lot more behavior issues, they may be quitting more often. And trying to find bus drivers is no easy task, and that's a nationwide problem. So that's another concern that I have. But, but again, you know, maybe try one and. Yeah. I think see, that you know. Um, well, no, actually, this, 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 the whole thing was spearheaded by the town administrator. So we actually, and this is actually a fact, I'm just stating a fact, we were not even allowed to have conversation on the initial, um, you know, contract or how it was going to be handled or anything with regard to that. What we have been allowed to do is I've been, you know, told what he wants and I provided what he wants. And then we had subsequent conversations about looking at the routes and then we had some yeah, we real gave them parameters good around conversation about that. Desired numbers. max ride time, yeah. desired max yeah. capacity, um, mm -hmm. you know, planned capacity not to exceed, you know, a certain number of, of riders, you know, depending on whether it's elementary versus high school, um, those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, 
that into your, into your question. Again, yeah, we didn't we didn't factor stops, dis disciplinary stops in, into the into, into it. Yeah, there wasn't any discussion about you know how things work. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm just thinking as parents, if I knew that there were 53 students or over 50 in mm -hmm. elementary run, mm -hmm. I think I would be dropping my child off, which then creates yeah. another issue with mm -hmm. the child. Thank you. That, that was something I, right. I meant to bring up as, as another, you know, another kind of one of those um, yeah. unanticipated consequences of, mm -hmm. of, of a decision where, yeah. you know, you try and you think you're going to put more kids on a bus, you end up getting fewer kids because everyone's dropping the kids off, and we already know we have we have traffic issues. So, um, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And I think that we this was brought up at a, a previous meeting, correct? We kind of, for us, yes. Yeah. Um, and I think for myself, and I don't know how the rest of the committee feels about this, uh, but for me to drive my decisions many times, I feel like if I don't have the community here to sort it through with me, yeah. there is no support. So, you know, it's it's been driven by the town, and I feel like we're kind of in a position where we have to do something. But. Correct. I feel like if parents showed up and we had support mm -hmm. from the community to fight against why we shouldn't do it, then that's kind of, we'll it's been that addressed. We, we, we will get that in September, the reaction. Oh, well, that's, that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. That, that <laughs> that's, that's frustrating for us as a school Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the important piece for me, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a message out to the community that if you have an issue with this, you should have been here tonight. Yeah. Well, because the problem is that we're, being held to a 2% budget, we need to find the money somewhere, and nothing is ideal. No. There, there is no no jackpot that's going to give us the money that everybody will be happy with. Um, yeah, there are no, know, there I are have no a kid that rides solutions. the bus, so I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm in, impacted by this as well. Hmm. Um, it's not anything, I mean, I don't think any of us want to cut bus routes and put 50 kids on a bus. Um, just to you know, to, to put it in perspective for those that don't have the document or maybe listening at home, um, you know, reducing the one bus route that, that I particularly would recommend, um, you know, increases ride times as as much as you know, 12 minutes um, on one bus from 31 to a max of you know that, that's this is, this is the max ride time on a bus um, from 31 to 43 minutes, um, 27 to 39 minutes in some cases. Um, you know, a lot of the, the increases are, we actually see a one minute increase, um, must be just leaving one additional stop there. Um, we see a six minute increase for, for one, of, one of the routes. So, um, you know, not, not a tremendous impact, but if you're already, you know, mm -hmm. on the bus for, you know, 39 minutes and now it's gonna be 44 minutes, you know. You know I will agree with tough, you though that so. the impact is less than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. seeing, it it, seeing it out in the minutes yeah. that it is, it, and, it and is again, smaller you know, than I, I thought. I think it it's small. It's based on you know assumptions built into the model. Yeah. You know, it's modeling. The, the assumptions feel sound um, in principle, but it's it's difficult to say exactly. You know, if if they, those assumptions deviate by a couple percentage points one way or the other, in in real in practice, these times can swing a little bit too. So just you know, we got to keep that in mind as well. So. I'm going to go the other way. Okay. The bus going from 30 to 53. Yep. That's going to be a problem. Yep. You'll hear about that day one. Yeah, and I, I think that's that. That to me, I, I would reverse the order in which again we we addressed these. If if we did a single bus, I, I would I wouldn't do that one first. That would be part of the second proposal, and the the revised report that we get back from the consultant will reflect that. So. Um, the other one's not so bad because it's only 10. They're yeah, that's, to that's what he was yeah. saying. Yeah. That one's a huge yeah. jump. So I'd want to monitor. Yep. So I, I would say don't get hung up necessarily on the exact bus routes you've seen changed here. Yeah. It's, it's more of the, the one versus two um, decision tonight. So. But I think these, these are the best two routes to address. Um, through their analysis. Um, just a matter of which order you would take them in if you were going to do one versus two. Okay. Any other discussion? Any other questions from the audience, comments, concerns? Thank you all for your input. Appreciate that. And it's not easy. No. 
but I do think it's a decision that we do need to make. I do think it's a decision that needs to be a school committee decision and not, not something that we put on the administration. Um, so. I, I, I would like the answer, and I know Courtney's asked it numerous times, but if we did go down two routes and had to put one back in, how would that work? How would the funding for that work? I would like the answer to that. I, I find it hard to say, yes, let's get rid of two if we don't know that come the end of September we decide we really need another one and we need to find that money. Um, and I don't know how to get that answer. No, no, because it's been until November either, mid-November, and then you're not allowed legally to go over an appropriation. We can contract, you know, we have to genus assign. Yes, I'm saying there's an appropriation. There wouldn't be. She wouldn't be able to sign off on the contract. Well, I, th I think that none of us really want to do the two yeah, I, I, anyway. Two, two feels so. risky for, for, for numerous reasons. It, again, it feels doable, but to do it at this point, it, it, it feels like there's there's too many unknowns and yeah, too the much risk there. Class yeah, but it, number, it, seeing the numbers, it does feel like some, maybe it's something we can get to by next year. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's nothing that precludes us from doing that next year, even though we'll be in a three-year contract at that point. We can still go back to the bus company and say, we're cutting her out this year. So. Oh yeah, because I always include that in my invitation so. for bids. That's why we get the overall pricing, and that's why we get a price per day per bus for a 35 passenger, 71 passenger, so we can add and deduct, yeah. and that's our decision as, as a school department or a school. So in, in the interest of moving us along, it, it feels like there's there's some interest in reducing two buses, possibly at some time, but, but not at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I there's also an interest in doing something and, and, and reducing one route and that we feel comfortable reducing one route. So with that, I, I would be looking for a motion so to approve the proposal to reduce one route. Yes or no? Oh, that, we forgot your other motion. Mm -hmm. Ah, let's, yes, we'll, we'll come back gonna, to that. We'll come back to that. that right, this yeah, is separate right, from right, this okay, discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I so that, just, I just, a, to just a motion to, a, to a, a, approve uh, the reduction of, of one route um, per the... Uh, the consultant's proposal. So moved. We have a motion from Jillian. Second. We have a second from Lisa. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Seeing none. All right. Good job, everyone. Not an easy decision, but I think it's one we need to at least try. Um, Who's going to be around in September still? <laughs> yeah. Not Jillian. Three of us. Exactly. Oh, we know where Jillian lives. We should have done the two. <laughs> All right. Be the That's what I was waiting for. So I'll be in the audience. All right, we, we actually skipped over a part of our uh, mm -hmm. consent agenda there. Um, we, we normally do these motions together with the, with the school department and budget. I asked Courtney to separate them because the, the language seemed to be getting a little cumbersome. Yeah, so, fine. Yeah. Um, so Jillian has a. Do you actually do you want to do you want to talk about it first? Um, um, no, because so, we already. Okay. Yeah. Just okay, so I'll make a motion to approve the FY 2020 overall school bus transportation budget in the amount of one million five hundred ninety three thousand. $387, which includes both in-district regular education of $891,036, which represents a budgeted increase of 6% as recommended by the town administrator, and in-district and out-of-district special education transportation services in the amount of $702,351, which represents individual transportation needs for special education students. We have a motion from Jillian. This is for our school bus uh, transportation okay. costs. Second okay. from Cali. Uh, any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Seeing none. Thank you. I lost my agenda. <laughs> here, here we go. Um, All the piles. Transfers and reclassifications. Are, are we up to the school business and operations manager report? Mm -hmm. We are. Oh, yes, I've got about two inches thick of material that I'd like to go over with you for approval. Yeah. <laughs> Tonight? Okay. <laughs> okay. So. I figured we deserve a little right yeah. there. All right, so we no, got a break. Anything for this evening. So nothing this evening. Them, Thank right? you. Um, so that, that well. does bring us back to um, we deferred our executive session minutes. We, we've got a bunch of these to catch up on. We're, we would like to have Jillian here to approve many of these um, before we lose her. Um, so. We only have her for one scheduled meeting um, before her term ends, uh, and someone new steps wow. into her seat. I, I would like to propose that we add a meeting on April 24th um, as well. Um, so if you guys could check your calendars and see if that's amenable. Okay. 
Okay, we have yes, yes. Yes. Yep. Kelly, yes. Mr. Maines, I think, already indicated he was available. Ms. Keegan, any issues for you to be available the 24th? I April 24th. <laughs> okay. I know. I it's already put you on the spot there. So, okay. um, you know, we'll, we'll add to our schedule on April 24th meeting where I, I'd like to focus mostly on those minutes, have it not be too long. Um, but if there's any other issues that we can address there, because I, I think some of these minutes will carry over to that, that April 1st, um, May 1st meeting, which will be Ms. Canaro's final meeting with us. Until she's back again in a couple of years, right? She's going to take a little break, and she's going to come back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Uh, topics not anticipated? So we skipped old business and new business earlier. Good. Yeah. All right. I'm just looking for a motion to okay. adjourn at 920. No, I'll make a motion to adjourn at 920. Motion from Julian. Second. Second from Lisa. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.